Morning, everybody. I'd like to call to order the May 9th meeting of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. Madam Clerk, if we could begin with a roll call, please. Certainly. Supervisor Cummings? Here. Hernandez? Present. McPherson? Here. Friend? Here. Koenig is absent. Thank you. Uh, if we could begin with a moment of silence. Is there any Board of Supervisors, a member of the Board of Supervisors, like to dedicate this morning's moment of silence? All right. If we could just begin with a moment of silence, please. Please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning, Mr. Palacios. Are there any changes to today's agenda? Uh, there are no changes to the agenda. Are there any board members that would like to remove an item from consent to the regular agenda before we open it up? Supervisor Cummings? I'd like to remove item number 24. All right, there's a request to remove item 24. Item 24 will become item um, 15.1. Are there any other items to remove? All right, seeing none, we'll now open it up to the community. Right before we do that, I'd like to turn it over to Supervisor McPherson, who'd like to open it up for public comment. And then the opportunity will be for public comment. This is for an opportunity for members to address us on items that are not on today's agenda, but within the purview of the Board of Supervisors, or any item on consent, or on the regular agenda, if you're unable to stay or can feel free to start lining up, but I'd like to turn it over to Supervisor McPherson. Uh, really some happy news. Uh, after years of discussion, uh, the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency's uh, sustainability plan has been given approval by the state, state Department of Water Resources. Uh, and uh, this has been a long, years long process uh, among five agencies, uh, Mid County uh, had its approved as uh, was expected earlier in the schedule last year. Uh, but uh, this was a, a tr tremendous effort, a cooperative effort between the county, uh, the San Lorenzo Valley Water District, um, the City of Santa Cruz, City of Scotts Valley, and the well owners. It uh, it was hours long meetings, time and time again. But we have to get it right. Uh, Santa Cruz County having no, um, we, we don't receive any federal or state water. So it's critically important that we protect our groundwater resources. And I think there's going to be some people that comment on that. I just want to thank those who participated in that effort. It was a long and some would say arduous uh, uh, campaign to get this far, but we're uh, well on track. And it's really welcome news that we have this sustainability plan uh, in place. And we're going to move onward and upward and forward uh, from now on, so it's uh, it's great. I want to thank all the participants. Uh, it was really a, a really a nice cooperative effort, and uh, we have a lot of work to do still, but uh, we'll keep with it. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Are there members of the community that would like to address us? Please feel free to step forward. Okay. Good morning, welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jennifer Herrera. I am one of the assistant directors with the County Health Services Agency. And I just wanna thank Chair Friend and board for proclaiming uh, May 6th through the 12th as National Nurses Week in Santa Cruz County. Um, I also wanna do a special shout out to all the county nurses as in our health services and human services department. This is my third year actually um, uh, being having the opportunity to uh, thank the board for Nurses Week. And this is my first year actually having the experience of being a patient myself in Santa Cruz County, giving birth to my first child over at Dominican Hospital. The nursing care I received there was excellent. And I've just, I'm extremely grateful for the care, the empathy, and the, the competent um, practice that I received over at Dominican as a patient. 
I'm also delighted to be here with fellow nurses uh, behind me, and we will take turns reading the proclamation um, that was signed by the board. Uh, so proclaiming National Nurses Week, whereas the American Nurse Association 2023 theme of Nurses Make a Difference could not be a truer once again for Santa Cruz County. Santa Cruz County nurses more than ever are vital to the well-being of our communities as we recover and continue to respond to the multifaceted threats to health and... Good morning. My name is Jennifer Holm and I'm here in my capacity as the director of the Cabrillo College Nursing Program. And whereas for the 21st year in a row, according to the Gallup poll, nurses are ranked number one as the most trusted professionals and the nursing workforce is the largest among all the healthcare professions and is nearly four times the size of the physician workforce. And whereas nurses practice in a wide variety of care delivery settings and they provide care to people living in both urban and rural areas and to vulnerable populations, including women, people of color, individuals facing health, racial and social inequities, low income individuals and individual with disabilities and good morning i'm eric conrad i am the chief nursing officer at dominican hospital whereas the needs of santa cruz county change post covid 19 nurses responding to training and education the workforce and future nurses to protect promote and preserve health in nursing is evolving to care for its community roles such as care coordinator faculty team leader informatic specialists, community nurses, primary care partners, and whereas nurses are uniquely trained to address some of the greatest threats to the community, family, and individual health, which include improving access to primary health care, the effectiveness of primary care delivery systems, improving mater maternal health outcomes and delivery of maternal health care. Um, including the care provided to the nation's aging populations, particularly frail adults, and controlling health care spending, reducing costs, and increasing the value of nurses' contributions to improving health and health care delivery and... Nurses from across the Santa Cruz County continue to respond to natural disasters and emergencies that are increasingly driven by climate change. Nursing practice care, they care for the heart, mind, soul, and body of patients, their families, and communities. The appreciation for our nurses during this time simply cannot be overstated. Thank you to the leadership team that from all um, entities of Santa Cruz County that came today to support us in this effort to recognize the nurses um, during Nurses Week. And I'd like to um, send my thank you as well to allow us to be here to proclaim Nurses Week and the efforts that we do to provide um, care in our community. I'm also a nurse at Dominican Hospital and I teach at um, Cabrillo as well. And my name is April. Dr. Whitley also as well joining us. Thank you. I'm Greg Whitley, I'm the Chief Medical Officer at Dominican. I don't have a statement, but I just like to thank all nurses at our hospital and all across the community because healthcare doesn't happen without nurses. Thanks for the time. Well, thank all of you. My mom is a nurse, special place in my heart. I appreciate the work that all of you uh, do, believe me. I know the long hours, uh, the tough shifts. I know there's a major nursing shortage, not just here, but across the country you are doing very, very important work. So thank you all, you deserve it. Good morning and welcome. Good, good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Rhonda Reyna. I have been maliciously prosecuted for pro trying to help and protect my daughter who was a family court kidnapped under color of law in violation of federal laws 18 USC 241 and 242. I've been maltreated by multiple law enforcement agencies, including the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Department. I'm really glad to see Sheriff Jim Hart in the audience here and the Santa Cruz Police Department. I did a public records request for the oaths of office of every deputy because my civil rights were violated while I was wrongfully put in the uh, county jail. I was not given three phone calls in three hours. I was not able to make a phone call for 24 hours. My glasses were taken away so I couldn't see anything and I couldn't call for help. I had to use a bathroom, a toilet in that everybody could see, including men, 
And I bravely had to pee in front of everyone, which could be a very humiliating experience to women. And the other women in the cell with me were very ashamed and embarrassed and asked us to help conceal that. That is against all policy. I wasn't given access to clean water. I had to use the water spigot over the dirty toilet that smelled of urine. And in all these COVID lockdowns, that cell was never cleaned. All the crappy food that we were given was left there. No one took the garbage out. It was a horrible treatment and violation of my rights. I'm an innocent woman, and that was proven in court later. I watched a woman dying of, looked like she was dying from heroin withdrawal. I asked for the oath of office, and I got redacted forms, which to me is a violation of U.S. Code 18, 2071. In contrast, I have the signed oaths of office certified by Secretary Weber of both Rob Bonta and Judge Rebecca Connolly. Every signature is on these documents in contrast to what Sheriff Jim Hart's agency gave me. I would like all these oaths of office signed. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman, Supervisors. Uh, what the people saw earlier was uh, one of the reasons why this uh, Board of Supervisors has cut the public time down to two records. Those are called designated speakers. You should be doing that on a Saturday on your own time to kiss each other's rear end. I saw the chairman of the board kissing some of the speakers out here in the hallway. You can get that from right there. Um, the California state legislature had this lady before them under Democratic control. Uh, it was reported that a Democratic state legislator, uh, Catherine Fogg, testified she wanted to quit the, long, the, the Communist Party long before I did. I was told I could not quit. Uh, quit. At a picnic, Hugh DeLacy wiggled his finger at my nose and said, Catherine Fogg, we made you and we'll break you. You have two monuments out there by the courthouse right now. There is a supervisor here that threatened both the Grange, uh, the people, and the property. And the sheriff over here has not and will not take a report just like the lady ahead. Uh, there's something really wrong uh, when you have the courthouse uh, with a communist enforcer. Uh, it turns out that uh, the Community Foundation has a social action program named after Hugh DeLacy uh, that was founded by Leon Panetta, who gave both military and policy information to the Red Chinese. He advocated the uh, communist control both sides of the Panama Canal. His co-chairman is uh, Lenny Mendonca, who advocates going into regions which you are going into. That was by executive order by Ronald Reagan in the state and by Nixon uh, in the White House. You're pursuing that. You should pull out of any regional agency because they're designed like Lenny Mandoka wants to get rid of 80% of the counties and cities. And uh, so does Willie Brown wants to get rid of all of them. Thank you. Good morning welcome. Uh, good morning. I also have a little complaint against the city. Um, on April 4th of this year, I was attacked by Nob, in Knob Hill. I was violently attacked, choked by this man, okay? So he gets arrested. He's got three counts of felony assault, three counts, serious bodily injury toward me, okay? he uh, First, he comes to court. He, he says, oh, I'm deaf. I can't hear. He's playing the system. My position this morning is I don't want this man falling through the cracks. So, so the jail releases him with no bail, three felony accounts and no bail. Oh, he's got COVID. So he's sent to a nursing home. Then I find that he's all, then he's released to some uh, nursing care somewhere, all just let go with no bail. I find this really, really disgusting. I don't feel that the county's doing their job. I wrote a letter to county super, the supervisors, to J Tim Hart, whatever. But anyway, I want somebody to help me not let this man fall through the cracks. This is no excuse. I don't think this man should have ever been let out of jail with no bail. And I would like someone to help me see that it doesn't fall through the cracks. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning and welcome. 
Good morning. Good morning, Chair and members of the board. I'm Sierra Ryan, the County's Water Resources Program Manager. I had the honor and the pleasure to work on behalf of the county during the creation of the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency and the recently approved Groundwater Sustainability Plan since the process began in 2016. There are 29,000 people who live within the groundwater basin, many of which are domestic well owners and recipients from small water systems. There's also critical habitat that supports threatened and endangered species that relies on the groundwater for survival. The Groundwater Sustainability Plan represents a robust resiliency planning document, which considers all uses and users of groundwater in the basin. It's a pillar of um, future water management and it advances county priorities for climate change, adaptation, and environmental stewardship over a 50 year planning horizon. I wanna thank Supervisors McPherson and Koenig for their commitment to the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency and for their hard work as Supervisor McPherson alluded to um, through the development of the Groundwater Sustainability Plan. I also wanna acknowledge the work of my predecessor, John Ricker, not only in the development of the Groundwater Sustainability Plan, but also in establishing the collaboration between the county and all of the partner agencies long before the passage of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. Um, well, in many ways, the approval of the plan by the state is really represents the beginning of our work, not the end. We have built a strong foundation for the future, and I look forward to continuing to represent the values of this county um, with our colleagues from the partner agencies and with the community. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your work, Ms. Ryan. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. My name is Gail Mayhood, and I'm here as a representative of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District and as their representative on the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency. And like the previous speaker, Sierra, um, I'm here to uh, laud the Department of Water Resources recent approval of the Groundwater Sustainability Plan, and especially the fact that it came with minimal uh, comment or corrections that needed to be made. And this is a welcome reward for more than five years of work by representatives from numerous agencies and interest groups in the county, including Supervisor McPherson and Supervisor Koenig. While the exception, acceptance of the plan marks an early important milestone for Santa Margarita Agency, what actually impressed me most about this process was that in the process of developing the plan, it, we all developed a new awareness and we changed operations enough that together with the conservation efforts of the residents of the basin, we've actually have a basin that's in better shape now than it was at the beginning of this process, even before we've begun to implement uh, some of the projects that are outlined in the plan. The stunning effort, ethic, excuse me, the stunning effect of lowering the groundwater use um, of San Lorenzo Valley um, when we were able to move water between different parts of our service area following the CZU fire, um, despite the destruction of surface water, shows how important it is for us to be able to use our water efficiently and how important it will be and how effective it will be when both the city of Santa Cruz and San Lorenzo Valley is able to change their water rights petitions to move water to the places it's needed um, to use our water most efficiently. The city and San Lorenzo Valley are now working together to figure out how to best convey San Lorenzo Valley's allocation of Loch Lomond Reservoir water and a newly funded pipeline between uh, Scotts Valley and the city will open Thank up you. the possibilities. I'm optimistic for the future of our groundwater basin. Thank you. Thank you for coming today. Good morning. Welcome back. Good morning, Chair Friend, members of the board. Thank you very much for your time this morning. I'm Nate Armstrong. I'm the chief of the Cal Fire San Mateo Santa Cruz unit. I want to spend the next minute and 50 seconds just chatting about, uh, for members of the public, the kind of transitional confusing time of burn permits in Santa Cruz County. Only because in Santa Cruz County, residential burning season is a little bit different than a lot of the state. That residential burn season is from December 1st till April 30th and does not require a CAL FIRE residential permit in Santa Cruz County, and that's by local ordinance. What it does require is a residential burn permit by the Monterey Bay Air Resources District, and in concert with that, MBARD issues a little partner document that's CAL FIRE safety regulations. 
The only reason I'm addressing this now is as we moved out of that residential burn period on April 30th, uh, CAL FIRE did issue a press release advising that it is still possible for landowners and managers in Santa Cruz County to still burn, but with a CAL FIRE issued hazard reduction or agricultural permit. Those permits can be applied for online at burnpermit.fire.ca.gov. Uh, and the only difference between that and that MBARD permit is our permit does require the property to be inspected by a CAL FIRE official. And we'll put very specific uh, language in that document, not allowing the burners to burn above a certain uh, degree of temperature, wind, or um, relative humidity. Um, we just want to afford every opportunity for landowners and managers in Santa Cruz County to reduce that uh, hazardous fuel vegetation loading on their property. But just to note that we will at some point have to issue a suspension of all of those burn permits as we move kind of deeper into the fire season. And I thank you very much for your time this morning. Thank you, Chief. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. My name is James Ewing Whitman. I guess I couldn't sneak in to be first, but I'm so I'm speaking now. You know, it's really quite amazing. Um, I'm addressing the Board of Supervisors in the County of Santa Cruz, California, United States. Um, some people are pleading for you gentlemen to do something, you know, when this document right here describes in 1917 that city and county boards are controlled by their city and county managers that are not elected officials. So you guys are just really reading scripts. You know, a friend put a book in my hand this morning. It's called Not Exactly the CIA. We were going over some stuff this morning. And I thought this was really interesting as far as scripts. This was written in 1976. So slackly in the perfect terrorist plan, it describes the World Trade Center situation in 1976. Wow, isn't that just fascinating? So to listen to all these doctors and nurses this morning talk about the stuff that they're that they're talking about, it's just truly scary how beguiling things really are. Um, most people that live in the United States call themselves Americans. You know, there's over 900 million people that live on the North and Southern uh, American continents. We live in the United States. That's only, uh, well, it was 333 million. So talking about the doctors and nurses, a lot of people have been doing some research and it's my understanding and I can provide that information that there've been over 26 million people that live in the United States that have had adverse reactions to these vaccines. You know, what are those things, you know? <clears throat> Nanotechnology, biosynthetic, uh, bioweapon parasites. Um, you know, I've got this stuff. I printed up a bunch of stuff. I'll say that, in the city council, you can speak for three minutes on many subjects, including the consent agenda. And why you men are not allowing that, I don't know. Why are people wearing masks, too, in this room? It's really setting a bad example for children. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to address this from Chambers? Madam Clerk, anybody online? Yes, sure. Chuck, your microphone is now available. Hello? Yes, we Hello. can. Great, thank you. Hello, my name is Chuck Schillings. I live in the first district. On the meeting agenda today sent out by the board, there was a chart under SB9 explained. And under SB9, uh, what is allowed is, is two primary dwellings and two additional uh, units, um, ADUs, on a single family lot without, explain, without a splitting. My situation is I live in a large lot um, approximately twice the size of lots around me. And I have a small house and an ADU and only 20% of my lot is covered. And I'm not ready to develop or split yet. I will one day, but um, what I'd like to do is add a 240 square foot tiny home. And when combine the tiny home and the ADU together, will we'll, uh, average combined the square footage will be less than what's allowed for an ADU by itself. But I'm not allowed to have an ADU in a tiny home on the same lot under the current tiny home ordinance. And really, it doesn't make sense to me that I can have two primary dwellings and two ADUs, but I can't have an ADU and a tiny home when combined, they, 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 they are they're less than just a tiny home, I mean, an ADU by itself. And especially in a situation where um, my lot would only be 23% coverage covered, and I would add um, 
uh, parking and all of that. So um, we don't want to overbuild in our neighborhoods, but there are situations like mine that have large lots and, um, and plenty of room where a tiny home should be able to be added, especially when they're less than the size of an ADU and a tiny home together. Um, and so what I'd like to do is ask the uh, board to take a look at that tiny home ordinance again and look to see um, if there is situations such as mine, large lots and all of that, where it does make sense to add a tiny home and an ADU, especially when a, when, under SB9 when you can add two homes and two ADUs. So please take a look at that and maybe think about revising that to allow special situations like mine where it makes sense. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Call in user one, your microphone is now available. This is Marilyn Garrett, and I'm horrified to hear the reports of the two women and the violent treatment by the sheriff's department. I witnessed a friend of mine on a so-called wellness check with six sheriff deputies, brutal, militarized-like assault, forced injection, uh, not... Uh, a, this should not be the behavior of the sheriff's department. It doesn't generate uh, trust. Uh, it should be stopped. I'd like to address the uh, 5G that is being installed, upgraded on every utility pole, antenna, et cetera. And I'm reading from Safe Tech international.org. The 5G satellite Internet of Things data AI juggernaut entails the manufacturing use and disposal of thousands of satellites in space, millions of new transmitters on Earth, and trillions of IoT gadgets, devices, appliances, and things that together pose one of the greatest threats of all humans generated corporation health and environmental assaults. Though being sold to the public as a way to address climate change, the gargantuan global technology footprint is itself a major contributor to environmental devastation. On top of this, the 5G infrastructure on Earth and in space will escape an inescapable, inescapable planetary microwave radiation surveillance grid, which will constitute a huge threat to personal freedom and autonomy. This needs to stop. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. We have no further speakers, Chair. Thank you. All right, I'll bring it back to the board for action on consent. Supervisor Hernandez, do you have any comments on consent? Just on item 27, I want to uh, thank you. Supervisor, if your microphone, please. Just on item 27, uh, I want to thank and congratulate uh, the appointment of my new arts commissioner, Hermenia Reyes Borges, uh, onto the arts commission. Uh -huh. That's it. Thank you, Supervisor Hernandez. Supervisor Cummings? I think Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, a couple items. Uh, item number 25, the seismic hazards map. I want to thank um, Supervisor Koenig uh, for bringing this item forward with my office. Uh, we found that our fire recovery process, uh, that identifying and mitigating uh, hazards can pose a time consuming and expensive, uh, expensive uh, barriers to rebuilding. Um, having this uh, countywide understanding of seismic hazards would be helpful in our efforts to address the housing needs here, um, as mentioned in the board memo. And also on uh, item number 43, the emergency repairs. I can't mention enough uh, and thank the Public Works Department team to address the emergency repairs that we've had to address in uh, fires, atmospheric rivers, you name it. Um, all of this work, including the bridge replacements, uh, slip out repairs, retaining wall repairs, take a lot of time and money. And it comes even as the staff is still completing work from the storm of six years ago that we still haven't caught up with that yet. 
Uh, it's a tremendous amount of work, and they've done a really great job with the funding that they have. And I just want to say thank you to all those in the Public Works Department and our, especially our road repair group. Um, we all get calls that uh, the pothole in front of somebody's house needs to be filled, and we get it. We're trying to get at those things as quickly as possible. And uh, the most highly traveled routes is what's being addressed, and especially for the road program that we've had in the county. Um, with what you have, you've done a tremendous job, and I want to say thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. I'll just briefly comment on item 52, which is a contract uh, for design services for the Children's Crisis Center. It's hard to overstate the need for this within our community, uh, both the increase in beds and stabilization services for youth locally. Uh, this is a very significant project for the county and a very needed project in our county, and, and it's moving forward very quickly. Appreciation for both our health services department as well as um, our CAO for the leadership on that project. I now ask if there's a motion for consent. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor Hernandez and a second from Supervisor McPherson. If we could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Cummings. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. Aye. And Friend. Aye. And that passes unanimously with Supervisor Koenig absent. We'll move on to our first item of the regular agenda which is item seven, which is a public hearing to consider, accept and file the county's fiscal year 23-24 proposed budget and 23-25 operational plan to approve the FY22-23 realignment of appropriations for various general fund departments, including 1.15 million for the January to March storm disaster costs to adopt resolutions accepting unanticipated revenue in the amount of 1.2 uh, 22390 million in the general fund and 344,381 in the library fund to continue the public, uh, the budget public hearing to May 30th and take related actions as outlined in the memo. We have the memo, the proposed budget, including a series of resolutions. We have our budget manager, Marcus Pimentel, our assistant county administrative officer, Nicole Coburn. Is this being kicked off by the CAO or is it okay? I'll hand it over to Mr. Pimentel. Welcome. Okay. Thank you, Chair Friend. Uh, I'll open it up and continue with uh, Carlos's uh, overview and we'll conclude with Nicole uh, finishing up on the operational plan. My name is Marcus Pimentel. I'm your county budget manager. Um, I'm pleased to start this year's budget hearings earlier than we've done in the past, uh, where you will be considering as a board our 23-24 proposed budget that was released on April 27, 2023. Just some of the information included in our proposed budget is the CAO Palacios' budget message our economic and financial budgetary outlooks, uh, information about county services, and more importantly, how our tax dollars are allocated across to other agencies throughout the county. And our, a lot of information about our demographics, a lot of information uh, leveraged through our, our partners with Data Share Santa Cruz, information about aging and, and home construction trends, as well as updates to our proposed 2023-25 operational plan and details, a lot of details in our award-winning online budget on departmental changes. After today's budget hearings, the hear hearings will continue for our two-day budget hearings on May 30 and 31st. At those two days, departments will present an overview of their budget changes and including detailed information within the uh, budget hearing packets, agenda packets. Our proposed budget will then be updated in, following the with the May 30 and 31st budget hearings with our supplemental budget materials. Those are typically things coming out of the May revised budget that is expected to be released this Friday and other changes that might be delayed from our incredible 10 plus weeks of storm response and recovery. And some of that is still ongoing. So that's just the intro. Um, we will move into our, what we plan to cover today is uh, Scale Palacios will go over highlighting uh, elements of his budget message. I'll provide an overview on our county's uh, economic and financial outlook. I'll provide our, uh, uh, the first preview of the proposed 23-24 budget. Again, we have a lot of information online and available in other uh, documents. And we'll conclude with uh, the proposed 23-25 operational plan. I'll turn it over to CEO Palacios to update us on uh, the big objectives of our county. Okay, th uh, thank you so much, uh, Chair Friend and members of the board. Um, I wanted to start off by giving you an overview of the um, economic context that we find ourselves because remember so much of our budget is dependent on what's happening at the national level and at the state level. Um, our local economy certainly plays a role, uh, but we are really subject to what is happening at the national and state level and that 
very much drives uh, our own budget. So the first thing to note is that we are currently entering a time of uncertainty of economic uh, recession more than likely. Uh, remember, we've been in an expansion um, for more than a decade. Uh, since 2011, when we had the uh, Great Recession, we've pretty much been uh, in an expansionary period that whole time. And so uh, we had a brief recession when COVID uh, started, but that quickly was uh, was countered with a very significant and sharp rise in federal spending, both um, at the Federal Reserve through their policies and also through fiscal policy of the Congress with the uh, various bills that were passed that provided a lot of uh, local relief, uh, both to our businesses and our government. And so uh, right now, we find ourselves in an environment in which the Federal Reserve um, is projecting a recession to start in 2023. Um, so this is, again, um, their Federal Open Market Committee recently issued this prediction. Uh, the recession they think will last, uh, recovery would last over two year period. So that's the official word from the Federal Reserve. Um, we also continue to be in a high inflationary environment uh, with inflation uh, last year being over 5%. Um, the um, Consumer confidence uh, level is also dropping. Uh, consumer confidence has dropped by 17% since uh, July of 2022. Um, average 30-year uh, fixed mortgage rate has increased from 3% in January of 2022 to 6.7% uh, today. And the and most uh, notably, the national average savings rate, which had reached a, a high um, of over uh, 17% in 2020, which was, and I think, the highest it's ever been, uh, and largely due to a lot of the federal policies, is down to 3%. So I think that's important to note that, that the national savings rate has dropped from 17% uh, to 3%. And so um, in that context, the state of California finds itself facing a $30 billion deficit um, you may have recently heard that the um, Santa Clara County, our much richer uh, neighbor to the north of us, is facing over a, a very significant $100 million deficit in their spending. So we're seeing the signs <clears throat> all around us uh, about the economic uncertainty that we're entering. Uh, and we, own, we also face our own um, systematic challenges in our county. Uh, one of the things that we did that I think uh, we really should stress and that is a, a success is that we were able to absorb without any budget cuts uh, the significant MOUs, uh, salary and benefit uh, increases in this last, uh, but in this budget. And so, uh, and this is all, all agencies are facing this across the state is that um, salaries are increasing uh, as we fight over more and more scarce workers. We have health increases are significantly arising, uh, and PERS continues to increase as well. And so one of our first challenges in developing this budget was just to absorb that big increase for our, our uh, most important asset that we have in the county and also the biggest part of our budget, which is our employees. And so we're very proud that we have a balanced budget that we're delivering to you, having absorbed these salary and benefit increases. The health market is something we really can't control and PERS we really can't control. Um, and we did absorb that. So I think that's a significant achievement, but it is also a challenge that all local governments are facing across the state is how to absorb um, these cost increases as you move forward. Uh, we continue to have deferred capital improvements. Uh, for years, we have been uh, facing uh, capital uh, deficits in our infrastructure. This includes both our buildings and facilities that we need to do more and more repairs and also our uh, road infrastructure and bridges and culverts and all of those very essential uh, community uh, infrastructure needs. So those are needs that we really do have to think about how we're gonna address in the long term. Uh, another thing that we are facing is more recent is the cost of our disaster responses. Uh, we were already facing a uh, need of $67 million 
um, that we spent in funds to be reimbursed um, by the federal government through FEMA that largely still remains outstanding. And then we had this current winter, uh, which is uh, also significantly uh, increased our exposure. Uh, we think conservatively that we are facing now up to $100 million in outstanding past and current um, disaster response um, recovery needs. And so that is a significant amount of money, $100 million conservatively from past emergencies and the current ones that we face. That's another challenge. In addition, um, we have to think about uh, other policy uh, changes that are coming. At the state level, we are, you will hear from our uh, health services and human services department about the implementation of Cal AIM, which is a very significant change in how we implement Medi-Cal uh, and our behavioral health and health services. Uh, this is gonna be a huge lift for us in the coming year. Also, we know that we have to prepare for care court. And this is at this point, a, a state mandate that we are not sure how it's gonna be reimbursed, but it could result in significant costs. And then we have other uh, local challenges. For example, we need uh, to improve our public safety radio system. The implementation of the next generation uh, radio emergency communication system has begun. We've begun meeting with all of the cities in the county and uh, all the so special districts and fire agencies to figure out how we can make sure that our radio communications are compliant with new federal standards and also meet the public safety needs of our various public safety agencies. And so that's gonna be a very significant cost. We think it's gonna be in the range of $30 million. Uh, the end result will be a state-of-the-art radio communication system in which we do not have the dead zones that we now have in some parts of our county, but it is gonna be a significant lift uh, to address. Uh, also, we have to think about how we're funded um, just to give you one example of how our county is funded, uh, we have the lowest sales tax rate in our county. Right now, our sales tax rate is 9%. Um, City of Santa Cruz has 9.25%. City of Watsonville and Scotts Valley at 9.75%. Just one example of how our we have various funding challenges. I know um, our budget manager, uh, Pimentel, will go over more of those issues in his presentation. At the same time, I want to make sure that we acknowledge that we have faced numerous challenges in the past and we have been successful. Uh, we want to celebrate the achievements we've had recently, uh, most notably the Coastal Rail Trail uh, grant funding that we have been allocated and the progress we're making on that project is very significant. It's going to be a community-wide uh, generational project. Uh, we also uh, in terms of generational projects, we want to make sure and note the Pajaro River funding in which we've secured over $400 million of state and federal funds and also uh, a local assessment district passed um, with, um, uh, with very significant local support. That was a huge, huge achievement that our county should be very pr uh, proud of. Uh, we also received grant funding to establish a children's crisis and stabilization center, um, which will be there to support our youth and our families in um, who are having mental health crises. Uh, there will be eight emergency beds and 16 longer term recovery beds that will open in this fiscal year. Uh, we completed the sustainability update to the general plan, uh, which created much more opportunities for housing and more sustainable community. That was after over a decade of work. Uh, we are implementing the climate action and adaptation plan to reduce climate impacts. And we want to make sure to note that we are at, at the forefront of decarbonizing Santa Cruz County, uh, also through our membership of Central Coast Community Ener Energy. Very proud of that membership. Uh, we also have established a broadband master plan uh, to increase access to high-speed internet for all residents and businesses. And we are completing the county equity framework to reduce disparities and help residents thrive. Uh, with all of this, I want to mention that we also have done a number of Project Home Key supportive housing projects to serve unhoused residents. And also we uh, fully reopened Simpkins Swim Center after a major uh, renovation of that facility. Uh, with that, I want to say that uh, despite the fact that we serve a number of different challenges, we've had a lot of successes as well. And I'm just highlighting a few of them. 
uh, for the board to, I, I think it's important to note that despite the challenges we have, we've done a lot of good work and a very significant generational work. Um, I'll tell you that the Pajaro River project and those of us who've I've worked on it for more than 30 years to see it got to this point and I thank the board for your leadership on this is truly an amazing accomplishment. And so uh, with that, I'll go ahead and turn it back to uh, the budget and manager Pimentel for the rest of the presentation on the board on the budget. Thank you. Um, so I'll provide just a backstop of the county outlook. This is more de explained in more detail in the budget group and the online budget and in the board packet uh, board letter. As we discussed at our mid-year, we, we updated and rebuilt our forecast model to look out five years. And our model is more based on actual results than budget authority. With that, we are still projecting deficits between eight and $10 million a year. We believe those deficit gaps are credible. We've also factored into this projection a reduction in the economic slowdown, a reduction in sales tax revenues and, re and revenues and resources for our public safety departments, and in particular our health and human services departments who rely on realignment revenue backed by sales tax. So we have a lot of revenues across the county that we're expecting to go down, and that's already built into our forecast. We are pessimistic, you know, or optimistic, I should say, on some of our key revenue bases. Uh, within the general purpose revenue tax base, um, we are projecting strong continued growth in property tax over the next five years. We're also projecting reasonably strong growth in the vehicle license fee. That's more pegged to property taxes than vehicle license fees. Um, so as property tax grow, it'll pull that line up. We are projecting a momentary slowdown in sales tax, about a, a 1% decline for 23-24, but that it'll start recovering in the out years. Cannabis tax, although a small revenue stream, is one that is just, it's the performance has been disappointing. We talked about that a lot more in our February mid-year report. More recently, we have been tracking the, the early preliminary results of our uh, single-use disposable cup tax. That amount is trending towards seventy-five to 100000 a year, well short of the 700000 that were originally projected. So uh, we're working with staff and the auto controller's office in particular is coming through the, the, the early preliminary filings to try to understand what, what, what the difference in variance is between the projection and what we're actually seeing in returns. Diving a little bit deeper, we've talked over the last year on our systematic underfunding, and we want to dive a little bit deeper into the sales tax space. Um, and I'll begin with property tax. While we do receive 13 cents on the dollar in property tax paid, it is lower than our peers and lower than state averages. And conversely, we have to spread that lower 13 cent allocation across a greater percent of our population than most counties, and certainly across many major roadways and infrastructures across our entire county. Um, we serve over half that population and, and most of the roadways live in the unincorporated area. So we, we get a smaller share of property tax, but we have to spread it over a larger base. Our sales, our sales tax is an area that we're we're concerned about, and it's more of a the trend towards online sales. While we appreciate the opportunity for consumers to have more buying opportunities, we're we're systematically underfunded in sales tax. When somebody, when a resident in the county, whether in Felton, Coralitas, um, Soquel, or Aptos, they go and they buy in a brick and mortar in a store in the unincorporated county, we get 19 cents on the dollar in sales tax paid. When they buy through the same retailer online, we get five cents and the other 14 pennies are allocated, 14 cents on the dollar are allocated to the other cities in the county because we have a lower share of retail tax, sales tax base. When that is purchased online and the online retailer ships it from a warehouse that they own, maybe it's in Bakersfield or anywhere in Southern California, that entire sales tax base is re-diverted away from our county and goes to where the warehouse is located. So we're we're estimating about $5 million a year in just general fund sales taxes being lost in this allocation methodology. There's nothing illegal about it. It's more of a state historical way of how they've allocated sales tax over the years, largely generated in the 50s, 60s, and 70s when occasional deliveries would come into your county. But that same model is how sales tax is being allocated online now. Um, so it's it's an area of ripe for reform. And I know cities and counties have been working over the last decade to try to get that area reformed. We've talked about our general fund reserves, but just a reminder that while we are cobbled together a 10% reserve for our general fund, it's largely predicated on the back of our health department uh, funding, which is requiring us to hold significant amount of dollars that could be used for our healthcare population, whether investments in capital or services, but we have to hold on to that to maintain our 10% reserve. 
we've our general purpose reserves have been de depleted because we've been front fronting costs on all of our storm damage and other disasters, COVID, CZU fires most re most recently. So we're expecting that as FEMA reimbursements come in, we'll be able to backfill those reserves that were used to front those costs and then free up some of those healthcare dollars in our out years. Moving into uh, just a recap of where we're at with our recent storm damage. Um, we are estimating about $50 million in response costs and damage costs from the January, February, and March events. We've recently been added into the uh, February, March event as a in the federal declaration that happened just last week. So we're starting to compile those costs and we'll be submitting that. This chart in front of you represents only COVID-19 pandemic response costs and CZU fire costs from 2020. Um, while we're thankful the FEMA has increased their payments to us by $800,000 since January, it's well short of the 5 million we were expecting to get this year. We're still hopeful that we'll get closer to the 5 million number by the end of next month, but it's something we're actively working on. And with that, we appreciate sincerely the board chair and this, and this board's leadership and support and working with state and federal congressional representatives and getting a lot of adv advocacy on our part. We're seeing a lot of more activity from FEMA. It hasn't yet translated to cash flowing into us, but we're seeing a lot more activity. Um, it's something we're going to have to keep up and be very persistent about over the coming year. So our proposed budget, just a reminder where we're at in the process. Today's uh, May 9th. We are starting our first of four budget hearings. Um, we will continue the budget hearings on two days of hearings on May 30 and 31st. These are presentations by the departments across the county and then conclude on June 13th. The budget will then be compiled and reconciled by the auditor controller and be brought back in September for official action. I know this slide is busy, but if there's a lot of good content on here, um, in total, the county's budget is 1.1 billion. We have 731 million towards the general funds, primary service operations. This budget is built on the back of a legacy of strong financial stewardship by this board and staff that has led us to have a AAA bond rating that has the result of lowering our debt interest costs. One of the outcomes of fronting so much money for our storm disaster costs is we're anticipating an increase in our annual borrowing this year to perhaps 55 to $60 million so that we can cover our payroll and operating costs for the months of uh, July through December. That's unfortunate that we have to borrow money to make, to cover our, our current operations for the first six months of the next fiscal year. But because of our strong bond rating, those interest costs at least will be a little bit less. We are, as Carlos Palacios, our CEO, has mentioned, we do have some challenges in front of us, both from mandated costs, public system, uh, uh, systematic upgrades, um, and, and expansion, and the need for facilities and services across our county. Um, so our, our budget is going to be constrained over these coming years with, the, with that economic downturn. It's just going to create a lot of pressure for us to try to meet those needs. Our general purpose revenue, we're projecting it on the whole going up from last year to 210 million. The bulk of it is in property tax revenue, 80, 89, nearly $90 million, and vehicle license fees of $42 million. Notably, we are including the expectation of uh, just over $14 million in FEMA reimbursements. So we're really going to have to work hard and make sure FEMA is delivering on what we need to see from them in the out year. We're also including a higher base of our transit occupancy tax and recognition of the voter approved increases that we received last year that will be fully implemented in the 23-24 fiscal year. We'll take that uh, 210 million and allocate it across uh, general government departments to the tune of 222.6 million dollars in support. Um, the largest uh, departments needing that support in our public safety and justice departments. Those are the departments for the sheriff, probation, public defender, um, district attorney, our office of response and recovery, for example. Our next big commitment is to supporting our health and human services deliveries of, of services. While most of health services is funded through federal and state programs, our human services requires a little bit more funding to make sure that their activities remain um, viable. Mr. Uh, P.M. Tom, I got just to interrupt the, the board. This is a really important slide to pay attention to because when we think of our $1.1 billion budget, people go, wow, the county has, you know, your billion dollar budget. But when you look at this slide, this is what we would in the past, we'd call net county cost. This is our discretionary general fund money. 
And so uh, when, especially for um, board members, um, Cummings and Hernandez, when you are in cities and you think of your general fund, uh, many, much of that, most of that in a city is discretionary. When we think of our general fund, most of it is non-discretionary. This is the only piece that's truly discretionary. And so even though we have this very large budget, this $222 million is really how we spend most of our discretionary funds. And you can see where, you know, how it's allocated here. Thank you. So included in this is also our debt and capital uh, funding commitments. And this is explained in more detail in our online budget and, and in the budget memo, uh, but included in here, and I'll cover in the next slide, some examples of the increases we're seeing next year across our departments. And as uh, Carlos Blasi has just mentioned, this really is, is, our, is our dollars that we're committing. And if you might recall in the slide prior, 210 in general purpose revenues allocated to, to leverage $222 million in spending. So from that perspective, we're spending $12 million more than our revenue-based supports. And we're expecting that to be offset by salary savings and other operational savings that we're expecting to occur next year. So to get a balanced budget, we're already gonna be requiring $12 million in reduced operating the savings. Some of the increases by those same categories in our proposed budget include a less than 1% of what we, uh, position increases, our full-time equivalent of 21.2 positions. That's 7 tenths of 1%. Our budget guidance that we sent out in the fall to departments was to hold the line wherever possible. And we thank the departments in, the, in this entire county. Hey, I should have really stopped and paused and said, we appreciate all of our departments. We've been uh, challenged once again with three months of storms, 10 plus weeks of direct response, ongoing response by many of our departments. And yet we produced a, a, a fully developed budget, reasonably on time, missed you know by two days late. Um, and met in large our directions and guidance. So most of the positions that are included in this year's proposed budget are funded through external sources, whether federal or state funding. And so we're really appreciative of the department's struggle to hold the line because um, we have a strong demand and increases in services across the entire county, but recognizing that we just do not have that funding source. Um, we appreciate all the work by departments to keep that line smaller. Across the entire county, our expenditures have increased by 30 million. Again, for the size of our budget, that's pretty modest, about a 2.8% higher than we expected. Some examples that are more detailed in the board report and certainly more detailed in the budget include investments in our health and human services department, as Plus, Carlos Velasquez mentioned, bringing on and uh, implementing the CalAIM, investing in our Ch Children's Crisis Youth Center, investing in uh, a master plan for a freedom campus, expanding services at our freedom campus. Um, those are examples of really strong work that we're supporting in this coming year. Uh, Human Services Department is expanding in the workforce development programs, as well as supporting as our population tends to be on a direction of becoming an, an older population. Human Services Department is, is investing in resources to support the, our aging population needs. Our public safety department, the largest increases we're seeing in that 7.3 million is in our detention centers for jail and, uh, and use services for medical and mental health services, combined about $3 million of mandated increases just to support our medical and mental health services in those areas. Um, other examples in, in our public safety in our public safety category include district attorney uh, supporting victim witness uh, support activities and increasing uh, uh, to one attorney to help with backlog and cases. Our public defender adding some legal support and an attorney to also help with the, the massive amount of backlog that they're experiencing. Our Office of Response and Recovery as they're continuing to prepare for the next disaster event, unfortunately, and preparing for one. Uh, investing in more training and, and setting aside some modest amount of contingencies so that we can do some immediate storm response and, and recovery efforts. And then within our land use and community development departments, it's notable that this currently shows a decline. That number will, will reverse. Our largest, one of our largest departments, the Division of Department of Public Works, their budget has been delayed. It'll be shown up in the supplemental budget and discussed in their supplemental budget hearing. They've been the most impacted department in all of our storm response. And it was just, it took, it was just at a point in time when we had to uh, allow ourselves the bandwidth to let that budget be presented in the supplemental process. So that negative number of 3.8 million drop will actually go up when the supplemental is included. But some other investments in our land use category include fully reopening the Simpkins Swim Center, um, including the 
previously board directed investments in vacation rental code compliance. And then across finishing off with our general government departments, some examples of our increases there are in our assessor's department. Um, Prop 19 was a property tax reform that will bring new revenue to our county, but that is gonna require more work by our assessor recorder's office. So they're uh, adding staff to help support those new activities. In our capital projects, we have proposals for new capital projects that include costs to finalize the construction of our Westridge Facility Center and other costs across the county for uh, capital investments. Again, there are much more details in the board report. There's extensive details in our online budget, and we invite the public and all of you to 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 review those budgets. And, and then departments will will dive deeper on those two days of budget hearings on May 30 and 31st. That's a real great opportunity. We'll go into the details of of all those budget recommendations. Just recapping what you'll find on our online budget and including this packet, we have a. Uh, two one-page summary schedules of the entire county budget by department. So you're able to see their revenues, their expenditures, and what how much of the county's contribution is required to support departments. Most of our departments are not fully funded, so they require contributions by us to help them maintain their services. So we have a one-page schedule on that. We have another one-page schedule that will show you last year's budget compared to this year's budget and where the increases are. And then we have a, about an 11-page schedule that will describe some of the changes that are being requested in the department budgets. And of course, our award-winning uh, online budget is available um, since April 27th, and we invite the public to to look through it, and we're happy to go present to uh, any community group meetings at uh, Wanna Talk Budget. Um, and again, on May 30 and 31st, departments will provide a, an overview. I wanna turn the, this over to our Assistant County Administrative Officer, Nicole Colburn, who will go over our proposed 2325 operational plan. So this year, as we were developing the budget, departments were also asked to develop new objectives for our new two-year operational plan covering the 2023 through 2025 years. And so uh, we did that successfully. And um, this July, once we bring a final plan to the board at the end of June, we'll kick off this new operational planning cycle so our new proposed operational plan um, that is also online on our budget website um, currently proposes 133 new objectives. Uh, these include some of the major projects and initiatives that are funded through the budget. And if you're looking at the online interactive website, um, as you're scrolling through the budget, you'll actually see objectives tied to various service areas, which will help provide that linkage. Um, in developing objectives, um, we set out and met three process goals. The first was to uh, have objectives that were more measurable. Um, we wanted to increase our objectives from 67% measurable to over 90% measurable. Currently, 92% or 122 of our objectives are measurable with a baseline and a target. This compares to some of our previous plans where departments set out to just achieve implementing a plan or, or something that was more binary. So um, I'm hoping as you'll look through the objectives, you'll see and take a look at um, what those targets are. Um, the measurable objectives really lead to greater accountability and better results for our community and align with our strategic plan. Um, the second goal was that we wanted a more inclusive process with staff. Um, and so we had over 800 county staff uh, throughout all of our departments participate in the development of, of objectives. Some of these staff participated on adaptive assistance teams um, they, where they were working on actually identifying data and ways to make our objectives more measurable. Um, these 800 staff equate to almost 30% of our full-time staff who participated in this process. Being inclusive really leads us to greater ownership of objectives by staff and makes uh, the objectives more likely to, be, to be successful. And then thirdly, we wanted objectives um, that were uh, aiming for more equitable results. So as you can see here, 50% um, uh, of our objectives use disaggregated data. And in the context of what this means for the operational plan, um, equity is using this disaggregated data to better understand how needs differ across our communities and then create targets that improve results for our communities. 
that um, have the furthest to go. Um, in the January, when we came and talked to you about developing this plan, we uh, talked about putting a spotlight on housing and climate action, which are two of our key initiatives currently. And as you can see, more than a third of the plan across both of these areas contains objectives that contribute towards meeting our housing needs and ensuring that we become more resilient as we recover from our, current, our past and current disasters. So we do have an opportunity for plan feedback. Um, if you're looking on our website, you'll notice that our objectives have um, a tag that they've been proposed. Um, today through the end of May, we're gonna be collecting feedback on our objectives. Um, we'll also be meeting with each board office um, to talk about the objectives and, and get obtain uh, further input from you. Um, but the feedback button on the ob online objectives will allow for the public to provide their thoughts on the objectives about how we might accelerate and strengthen our work. Um, once the feedback period closes, our office is going to be working with departments on final revisions to the objectives. And we're going to do this within the constraints of whatever budget or legal authority we have. And then we will be presenting the final plan to the board at the regular meeting on June 27th. Um, I will note, fall subsequent to that, we are closing out our current two-year operational plan. Um, we are bringing an update on that, the final update of that two-year plan to the board in August. And there will probably be objectives within that plan that are um, roll into this new, new two-year plan. So we'll, we'll provide those updates and make those incorporations when we come back to you in August. Um, so with that, uh, these are our recommended actions. I'm not going to repeat them, but if you have any questions for us, Marcus, myself, and Carlos are happy to answer them. Thank you. Are there questions from board members? Supervisor Hernandez, do you have any questions right now? Oh. Supervisor Cummings? I'm, I guess the one question I, had, I do have, I know the board provided direction um, the previous um, meeting to have some funds incorporated into the budget for um, stipends for commissioners. And I'm just wondering at what point we'll be able to kind of see those items and other items that board members want to bring forward. We, we have already taken note of that and that's included on our June 13th list of action items that the board will consider. So we've already got that set up for, for to take action on, on June right. 13th. Thank you. And I, I guess I'll just say, I appreciate all the work that's gone into us, especially under, um, you know, the circumstances that we've been facing this entire year. And also just want to express my appreciation of um, meeting with the board members to get their feedback on the operational plan um, as being part of having an inclusive process. And so that ends all my questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Cummings. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I have some comments. Um, <laughs> welcome, Supervisors Cummings and Hernandez. Um, it wasn't like this five or six years ago. So this is a heck of a challenge. And I, I just want to thank uh, our CAO and Mark Spimitel, our budget manager for um, this online budget that I think it makes it more understandable for the general public of what kind of a situation we're facing. Uh, it's really not a pleasant one, but it, it's been especially challenging, as we know, because of um, the past two years and more, the 2016-17 storms on, but COVID sees you fire the atmospheric rivers um, and um, what we're still owed. Uh, Boy, if that doesn't come through, I don't know, uh, we're in a world of hurt. Um, we've endured these challenges very well, I think, as best we can. And I am very much appreciative uh, appreciative of the uh, CAO and the, the board and all our partnerships with our county employees. We know we're well aware of how much extra time you have put in and what you've done under these uh, terrible circumstances that we've faced. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, our workforce has really sacrificed uh, above and beyond the call of duty to meet the challenges that are that are facing us um, through no fault of our own. Uh, this is not mismanagement of a budget. This is um, natural disasters personified uh, over and over again here in Santa Cruz County. Um, and I think we we do need to uh, continue our cautious uh, approach as we wait these reimbursements up to a hundred million dollars it appears um, for the disaster response and 
when I look at the projects we'll be able to tackle with this facing us, it's truly amazing to me that we have online to do a lot of great things, additional things uh, in the areas of health, public safety, parks and recreation and housing. Uh, it's To me, it's pretty amazing that we're able to hold the line and uh, keep a 10% reserve too at the same time, because we may well need it in the near future. Um, one thing that I will say, uh, it's um, this is realistic, but the, I, uh, the state, uh, I think the, the May revise is going to be coming out this Friday, I believe. And it's not going to be as pretty as it was. We thought it might be uh, the first part of the year. Uh, it looks like they're going to, the state's going to be in a $30 billion deficit. So that, that really raises concerns to, uh, to us. Uh, and that, in addition to, um, the new programs that the state is demanding that the counties implement, that two of them were mentioned, the Cal Lame and the Carrot Court. Um, please just, uh, you know, cool your jets, please state on unfunded mandates. Uh, I, these are all great programs. They're needed and we want to implement them. But we are absolutely are gonna need the funding to do that. And uh, I just can't, uh, I just hope, and I know our state representatives, uh, Gail Pellerin, John Laird, others, uh, Robert Rivas uh, is soon to be speaker of the assembly, I believe. Um, they're, 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 they've taken note of it, we've let them know, but we face some undaunting, uh, uh, really not, uh, almost unrealistic challenges if we don't uh, hold the line, the state doesn't hold the line on demanding what we have to do for them and what we want to do for the people of Santa Cruz County and the people of California. Uh, this is one of the most uh, uncertain times that I can recall in my my years of public service in state and federal government. Uh, we, we, we're going to do what we can with what we have, and I think you've done a phenomenal job, and I really appreciate the online budget again because people are uh, they're better able to understand what we're facing. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. I'll make a couple of brief comments. I, I think that we've seen how the, the systemic underfunding of Santa Cruz County structurally um, has led to a lot of the challenges that we faced even during the winter. Um, when you're receiving less than half than some of your neighbors or comparable counties in tax allocations because of a Prop 13 formulation, um, when you have uh, a topography that's unique and more likely for natural disasters, and then you have infrastructure failures because of a lack of investment over it because of that systemic underfailing, uh, underfunding. Um, we have issues that will then continue to put pressure on the budget moving forward in ways that at some point, something will have to give. There will either have to be a fundamental shift of how the state allocates resources, because this isn't a question of how many how much is paid by local residents. I mean, you have local residents paying a significant amount of property taxes, just the money just doesn't even stay necessarily locally. Um, but if you were to put this in perspective, I mean, we have over 10% of the total budget, but much more of the discretionary budget in funds that were just simply owed in reimbursements for federally declared disasters over the last few years. And yet we receive less than half than many of our comparable counties and, and local tax revenue. So if you think about what this is gonna look like as we move into a recessionary period, uh, with costs increasing, revenues decreasing, and continued natural disasters occurring, you know, the county's gonna have significant budgetary pressures uh, facing it in the next five to 10 years in ways that will need action, not just locally, but uh, uh, above our level in order to address. And the reason why there hasn't been these investments is because of the need to address these issues over and over and over again. Uh, not just in the last couple of years, but historically in, in Santa Cruz County. And I think that it, it says a lot about the restraint also of the board. I mean, there, there hasn't, there haven't been the, the, there's a lot of pressure to make investments in individual programs or desires or um, individual uh, requests from board members may come and go on these situations. The, the challenge is, is that we, we have made decisions as a board to try and reduce as many of those so that when it comes, when the inevitable cut time comes, the cuts just aren't that aren't as bad as they could be. 
Supervisor McPherson and I, uh, the old timers on the board, <laughs> have been through situations where we've had to make really painful cuts. And the employees have, have also, uh, we've done furloughs, we've done layoffs, we've been through a lot of challenges here. And I see a lot of that coming down the pike is if the, so the board's gonna have to ensure that our, our costs are contained um, and our requests are contained until we can really receive our fair share uh, of what we we pay. Uh, I, I know that I hear all the time, I mean, I pay X thousands of dollars in property taxes. Why can't you do Y issue? You tell them that 13 cents in the dollar stays here. People just don't, they're not aware of that situation, but also, um, you know, that, so this, the system will have to change. Uh, it, I think that it's going to be tough for this county moving forward without that systemic change at the state level, or we're going to constantly get the same budget press. I mean, I almost feel like there's a little bit of a groundhog day to this, right? Same presentation from CAO every, every year, no matter what the situation is, that we don't have the funding, systemically underfunded, we need to hold the line. Departments that are asked to do more with less, um, and they're struggling, and, and at some point the band will break. And we saw a break this winter, and and now we're also not receiving the the reimbursements back from the federal government in a timely manner, and and it's it's a it's a very challenging situation. But I appreciate the professional management of this team. I don't, you know, if you look across, I, I'm fortunate to serve on the National Association of Counties Executive Board. I just got to tell you, I mean, there are a lot of counties that aren't managed this well uh, across the country that aren't just making massive cuts. I mean, they're making massive cuts, but they're also dealing with a lot of other issues on the, in particular on the financial side. And so I just uh, appreciate our professional management team here uh, uh, doing everything you can to hold the line. Um, I'd like to open it up for the community as an opportunity for you to address us on these. Oh, I apologize, right before I open it up, Supervisor Hernandez, you do have a comment. And then I will open it up to the community for the public hearing. Yes, Supervisor Hernandez. I wanna thank staff for the, for the presentation, thorough presentation. Um, you know, just two comments. Uh, I, I just wanted to make sure that we uh, continue to pursue to find a way to to fund uh, the 181 uh, park space sooner rather than later. Uh, I think there might be some some uh, opportunities for us to pursue uh, for that park space, and I just want to make sure that we stay the course on that one. And also, uh, just to for us. I want to keep the discussion going with uh, Murphy Crossing. Uh, keep it on the front burner uh, as we continue. And if there's any uh, any opportunity to expedite it, that'd be great. Um, it'd be great, be greatly appreciated if we continue that project. But let's keep the discussion going on that one. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry if you hold you up on that. So now I'd like to open up the public hearing on this. Welcome. Thank you again. First of all, I disagree with many of the statements that were made, um, uh, particularly with uh, Mr. Palacio's report. I'm experiencing much higher than 5% inflation. I feel like there's a lack of understanding of economics and biology. Um, we're we are carbon-based organisms. We're humans. I feel like there's an anti-human agenda. I'm forced to walk by 666 on the ground with just the sign of the beast in the book of Revelations. And that makes me feel very uncomfortable. Please add one more six so I don't feel threatened by that. Um, I am grateful that Palacio did point to the discretionary funding. And I see that the safety and law enforcement expenditures far exceed anything else. And as we can tell by public comment that we are not actually safe. It's a complete waste of money. The deputies have not proven that they're under oath of office. So um, we can slash and cut that bu budget because they're putting innocent people in jail and harming them. And they're letting violent offenders out. And that is a disgrace. And that is not for our safety. It is also clear by the kidnapping of the children here in Santa Cruz County that there is a lot of question to the nefariousness and untrustworthiness of mental health as um, Senator Rubio has drafted uh, Senator Rubio has drafted Peaky's law that's currently going through um, with these fraudulent reunification therapists. I'm very concerned about the over expenditures and mental health funding, and I don't feel safe by any of that. I am more than happy to participate in these budget discussions, and I would like to know how to be um, more at the front of it rather than at the end of it and sitting here in these uh, two minute, you know, where I'm giving a two minute comment on my ideas and my feelings about how things are being spent here. I'm a resident of Santa Cruz County. I was born here. Mr. Friend, I think you're from 
San Diego, uh, Mr. Cummings, I think you're from Chicago and Koenig is from Massachusetts and only the two end supervisors are local. Um, I disagree with a lot of what you said, Mr. Fier McPherson. Thank you. Morning, welcome back. Yeah, hello, my name is James Ewing Whitman. Uh, I was here last year for the four days of the budgetary hearing. What was it, 1.3 billion? Oh, I can make a lot of comments, but three, even three minutes really isn't enough. Maybe I should have asked to talk for 15. So, you know, about the COVID CZU $67 million deficit, you know, it kind of reminds me of some stuff I brought up in the activist groups I was in. I think I wrote something, what was it, October or November 7th about how to stop what's going on with these uh, bioweapon injections. But I suppose moving forward to rather than talk about lawsuits, um, wrote something maybe five or seven years ago about how I feel this county could gross in a three or four day weekend at least three hundred thousand dollars with a uh, capital and renewable investment of less than a hundred thousand dollars. And I mean, and I kind of mentioned that because as far as solutions, you know, I already brought up this book about the CIA stuff and about how things are really controlled. But I wish I'd brought the book, The Doctrine of the Lesser Magistrates, because all of us as individuals are lesser magistrates. And we actually have a lot more freedom and rights than those who actually took a oath of office, whether it was to the original constitution or the corporate constitution. So I know that there's lots of ways where the community can work together. And I was very happy to engage with a officer in Capitola last the Sunday before last, who had been an officer for 25 years. And it was just a really fun, pleasant conversation. And I asked him if he was familiar with the BSA program, COPE. And he said that he was. And then I asked him if he was familiar how you can get groups of young individuals to really work together and, and isolate it so they all work together as a team. So I really could, I'd like to talk about solutions, but this is interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else in chambers I'd like to address us? Good morning and welcome. Good morning, Becky Steinbrunner. I see the, the uh, barrier is still here, only for the public. Please take it down. It's symbolic and I'd like to see it taken down. I, um, I have arrived late, so I haven't heard the full presentation, but I understand the issues that are before the board and before the public regarding the budget situation. And it is shocking news to hear from you, Supervisor McPherson, that the state's budget is even worse than we thought since it had such a great surplus last year. Um, so in keeping with all of that, I think that your board needs to really look at the wisdom of the large property purchases that you have authorized in the last year. The West Marine Complex in Watsonville is wonderful, but that is a huge drain on the county budget. Purchasing the, um, the new building next to the Sheriff's Center on SoCal Avenue is very nice from Bay Federal, but it's a huge drain on our budget at a time when, as you've said, we don't have the money. I also question the wisdom of selling the tower on Fire Station 2 in Watsonville, the county comm tire tower, and now being a renter on a tower up on Mount Madonna from Etherix. And I, I want to point out that maybe you can start looking at excess property that the county owns or leases, such as the offices on Clare Street and 41st that staff has admitted is very underused. It was supposed to be a place where people could take kids that had been abused and interview them in, an, in a more comfortable place. It's not used. So we need to look at our own excesses. You need to too. And please consider the issues that I've brought to you this morning. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Murder. Is there anybody else in chambers that would like to address us? Please. Um, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to make a, 
recommendation that uh, the board invite more uh, senators, uh, state assembly people and congressmen, because a lot of the issues that are facing us were made someplace else. And um, they need to really get more involved with what's happening on a local level. And you guys, we're all being forced to do things that were made over the last 30 years, either new laws enacted by the federal or state government, uh, laws that have been reinterpreting, or courts that have reinterpreting the meaning of laws that has basically forced a lot of these issues on all of us. So I think it would be incumbent on everyone, including individuals, to get more involved in state and government um, officials to say that we really do need some help here to take care of some of these problems. I think that you guys and everybody here in the county are doing a wonderful job. You're really trying to cope with all these issues that basically have been thrust upon all of us. And so I know how difficult it is to for everybody. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Anybody else in chambers like to address us? Madam Clerk, anybody online? Yes, sir. We do have speakers online. Call in user two. Your microphone is now available. Marilyn Garrett, I heard Carlos Palacio state that the broadband master plan is to reduce disparities and help people thrive. I think that's a, a, a lie uh, because uh, there's no evidence of it. And what people need to th thrive is food and housing and good employment and a healthy environment. And uh, broadband actually violates our right to public safety and health. Here's some basic facts. You've been provided over a 20 year period by me and disregard. And I consider omission of facts a form of lying. This is from a group called Pittsfield Cell Tower Concerned Citizens in Massachusetts opposing a cell tower. And all of these amid radiation 24 seven, here it is. Radio frequency is a pollutant. It's a toxin and a high hazard. Let's ensure everyone has the facts. The National Institute of Health has absolutely found damage from radio frequency, radio frequency radiation far below FCC guidelines. Quote, non-thermal exposure has been shown to alter human brain metabolism by NIH scientists. Electrical activity in the brain and systemic immune responses. Chronic exposures have been associated with increased oxidative stress and DNA damage and cancer risk. Also, want to refer you to an article in. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Is there anybody else online? Yes, Chair. Call in user 1192. Your microphone's now available. Hi, I'd like to um, com comment on what the other caller just said about the harmful exposure <clears throat> of microwave radiations. And I have a manual from the Air Force Rome Laboratory in New York, and it is from 1994 that they have known that exposure to microwave radiation has been observed to cause physical operation alterations in the essential cells of the immune system and a degradation of immune, immunologic responses. Experimental results published by the Soviet Union and Eastern European researchers indicate that irradiation can cause injury and trauma to the internal body organs that comprise the immune system. Even exposure to low levels of radio frequency microwave radiation can impair immunologic function. Also exposure to the eye Radiation causes physical duress that can lead to damage of the ocular tissue. It's 
exposure to radio frequency microwave radiation is known to cause cataracts in the human eyes. Several cases have been documented that report that microwaves induce cataracts in humans. Typically, lens opacities have resulted from exposure levels that are greater than specified by the various safety standards. However, minimum exposure levels are sufficient to cause ocular damage. There's not certain about that. But there's another thing I want to bring up is that there's something called, I think, the Confidential Financial Report. That's a separate set of books that the government keeps. And there is a federal law that I think applies as well. And, the, and I'm going to read that. Uh, two six federal law two six um, three four point nine zero one a the confidential financial reporting system set forth in this subpart is designed to complement the public reporting system established by Title I of the Act. High level officials in the executive branch are required to report. And this is a public hearing on the budget, so if we could keep it topical, that would be appreciated. Are there any additional speakers online? We have no further speakers, Chair. Okay, we'll close uh, the first element of the public hearing and bring it back to the board for action. There are a series of recommended actions. Is there a motion for recommended actions? I'll move the recommended action. All right, we have a motion from Supervisor McPherson, a second from Supervisor Hernandez. Uh, excuse me, and a, a comment, please. Uh, one comment I forgot to make earlier is that just that uh, with the disposable cup tax, my hope is just that we can try to figure out how our numbers are so far off on that. Um, and you know, if there's any need for us to have similar enforcement that we do for TOT, that we really think about how we can make sure that we're maximizing the amount that we're getting from that tax, because um, I think we were all hoping that we'd be generating more revenue from it, and it's a little sad to see what where we're at, but um, hopefully we can figure that out and, and try to get more revenue from that tax as well. All right, thank you. We have a motion and a second. If we got a roll call, please. Supervisor Cummings. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. And Friend. Aye. That passes unanimously with Supervisor Koenig absent. We'll move on to item eight which is a public hearing to consider a resolution confirming proposed fiscal year 23-24 benefit assessment rate and service charge reports for county service areas number 53, 53N, and 53S for mosquito abatement and disease controls outlined in the memo of the Agricultural Commissioner. We have the agenda item memo, the rates attached on the resolution. I think Ms. Bolson, are you giving the presentation today? Oh, okay, I'm sorry, just the, and I think the, yeah, we good morning, welcome. Good Thank morning. you for waiting. Um, good morning. I'm Amanda Polson. I'm the assistant manager for the Mosquito and Vector Control Division of the Agricultural Commissioner's Office. With me today is our interim Ag Commissioner, Dave Sanford. Um, so the county service area CSA 53 was established in 1993 and then expanded in 2004 and 2005 for South and North County, respectively, to provide mosquito control and public health services to Santa Cruz County. These services are funded by a benefits assessment and rates are adjusted each year to account for inflation. On April 11, 2023, the board set today, May 9th, as the public hearing date on the proposed benefit assessment rate reports that will provide operational funding for mosquito and vector control in 2024. The CSA rates presented have previously been approved by the board and are outlined in the rates attachment and either remain at the same level as in 22 and 23, or have rates at a and a consumer price index increase of 3% as approved in previous elections. These rates have been posted in the local newspapers and made available to the public at the clerk of the board and mosquito and vector control website prior to today's hearing. If approved, rate reports will be forwarded to the auditor controller by August 10th to be included in the 2023 to 2024 property tax assessment rule. We recommend the board open the public hearing to hear objections or protests to the proposed three assessment rate reports for CSA 53, North, South, and Original. Then please close the public hearing and consider adoption of the resolution confirming the benefit assessment rates reports for the fiscal year 23-24. Thank you for your support. Thank you, Ms. Polson. Um, look, this is a de minimis investment that pays significant public health dividends. So I appreciate the work that you and your team do. Um, are there any comments from board members before we open up the public hearing? See, none would like to open up the public hearing. Is there any member of the community that would like to address us on this item? Yeah, hello. I am addressing uh, item number eight, the mosquito abatement and disease control. 
want to say for the record that both on item number eight and number seven, I at least one member of the public should raise their hand to having some questions. You know, it's really quite fascinating, the commentary on the previous one that is very similar to this one, and there are elephants in the room that people aren't talking about. I don't expect people to believe a word I say, but 24 gigahertz kills insects. The methods that can be used to affect, kill, make things infertile, done with frequencies, are just not really being talked about. So I'll be brief and respect everybody's time, but I do want to make a note on number eight and number seven. Thank you. Is there anybody else in chambers like to address us on the, the benefit assessment? Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. I appreciate the health benefits of mosquito control. I just want to um, make sure that the, uh, the mosquito vectors department does use non-toxic uh, methods of controlling mosquitoes. And um, I do not agree at all if there is any plan to release genetically modified mosquitoes to reduce the breeding in in the uh, areas where mosquitoes gather. <clears throat> and I think this is uh, something we have to look at in terms of where mosquitoes are in the food chain. It isn't just that they come bite us, <laughs> but there are many birds that uh, and fish that rely upon them. So we have to think beyond um, ourselves and the effects of this piece of the food chain. Um, the, the cliff swallows come here from Argentina every summer uh, to raise their young because there is so much food in the Watsonville Slough area. And we need to be mindful of that and affects uh, cumulative effects of any treatments that we use to control mosquitoes. Thank you very much. Anybody else in chambers? All right, seeing none, Madam Clerk, is there anybody online? No speakers online, Chair. All right, we'll close the public hearing, bring back to the board for action. Is there a motion for the recommended actions? I'll move. I'll second. We have a motion from Supervisor McPherson, a second from Supervisor Cummings. We have a roll call, please. Supervisor Cummings. Here, or aye, sorry. McPherson. Here, aye. Friend. Aye. Hernandez, absent. All right, that passes unanimously with Supervisor Hernandez and Supervisor Koenig absent. We'll move on to item nine, which is a continued public hearing to consider certification of the vote results for County Service Area 3, Aptos Seascape, adopt a resolution confirming previously established benefit assessment as outlined in the memo of the Deputy CAO and the Director of Community Development and Infrastructure. We have the board memo, the certification of the votes cast in the resolution. We have uh, Mr. Machado, who is our Deputy County Administrative Officer and Director of Community Development and Infrastructure. Good morning. Mr. Machado. Good morning, Chair, friend, and supervisors. Uh, the item before you is a continued public hearing for CSA 3. Um, ballots were mailed out uh, to the affected property owners within CSA number 3, and the tabulated results confirm majority of property owners within the service area disagree with the increased assessment rates. Uh, the ballots that were mailed, uh, we mailed 1,498 to the affected property owners. Uh, 805 were returned with 398 yeses and 407 noes. Um, uh, the recommended actions today after close of the public hearing are to accept the certification of the vote results and to adopt a resolution confirming previously established benefit assessment uh, rates. And I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Machado. Any questions from board members? All right, we'll open up public hearing. Is there anybody from the community that would like to address us on this item? Is there anybody online, Madam Clerk? Okay, we'll close the public hearing and bring it back to the board for action. Is there a motion? Uh, just a question. If if it's not going to get done, what less is going to get done? Or Yeah, so they were at, uh, the community had asked to uh, do an increase, and so they are just going to not be able to increase the services that they already provide. Um, so the current assessment stays in place. Okay. Is there a motion for Supervisor uh, McPherson? Uh, I'll move the recommended action. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor McPherson and a second from Supervisor Hernandez. So we could have a roll call, please. 
Supervisor McPherson. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. And friend. Aye. Cummings absent. All right, that passes unanimously with Supervisor Cummings and Supervisor Koenig absent. Move on to item 10, uh, which is a continued public hearing to consider the certification of vote results for County Service Area 40, Ralston Way, and adopt a resolution authorizing and levying assessment for road maintenance and operations. Is outlined in the memo of the Deputy CAO. We have the agenda item, the certification of the votes and the resolution. Mr. Machado. Thank you, Chair Friend and Supervisors. So uh, this is a continued public hearing for uh, benefit assessment rate increase for CSA 40. Uh, ballots were mailed out to the affected property owners within CSA number 40, the Ralston Way, and uh, the results show that a majority of the property owners within the service area agree to the increased assessment rates. Uh, the ballots that were mailed uh, were 14. 14 ballots were mailed to uh, affected property owners. 12 were returned with 11 yeses and one no vote. Um, the recommended actions after close of public hearing include accepting the certification of the vote results and adopt a resolution authorizing and levying an assessment rate as described. And I'm here to answer any questions you may have. I think I don't have any questions. Any board members have questions? All right, we'll open up the, the or the continued public hearing. Anybody from the community would like to address us on Ralston yeah. right? Service Area 40? Anybody online, Madam Clerk? No speakers online, Chair. Okay, we'll close the public hearing, bring it back to the board for action as a motion. I'll move the uh, recommended actions. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor Cummings and a second from Supervisor Hernandez. We got a roll call, please. Supervisor Cummings. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. Aye. And friend. Aye. Passes unanimously. Supervisor Koenig. Absent. We move on to item 11, which is a continued public hearing to consider certification of the vote results for County Service Area 51, which is Hopkins Gulch Road, and adopt the resolution authorizing and levying assessment for road maintenance operations and projects as outlined in the memo of the Deputy CAO. We have the board item, the certification of the votes, and the resolution. Mr. Machado. Thank you, Chair, Friend, and Supervisors. So this is a continued public hearing for CSA 51. Um, ballots were mailed out to the affected property owners. The tabulated results confirm the majority of property owners within the service area agree to the increase in the assessment rates. Uh, we did mail out 63 ballots to the affected property owners. 25 were returned with 23 yeses and two noes. Uh, the recommended actions after close of the public hearing are to accept the certification of the vote results and to adopt a resolution authorizing levying an assessment for CSA 51. And I can answer any questions that you may have. Questions from board members. Seeing none, anybody in the community during this continued public hearing that would like to address us? Anybody online, Madam Clerk? Yes, Chair, we do have a speaker online. Thank you. <clears throat> Call in user two, your microphone's now available. Carolyn Garrett, that seems like a very low turnout of voter response. I wonder how well it was publicized. And also things like our taxes um, should be uh, already taking care of assessment for road maintenance. And as I've stated before, I feel like uh, much of the money from the county, and as Becky Steinbrunner stated, is being unwisely invested on products, uh, projects that don't really help the public. We need the road repair. Our taxes should pay for that. That's my comments. Okay, is there anybody else online? No further speakers, Chair. Okay, we'll close the public hearing and bring it back to the board for a motion. Is there a motion? So moved. A second. Thank you. We have a motion for the recommended actions from Supervisor Hernandez, a second from Supervisor Cummings. If we could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Cummings. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. Aye. And friend. Aye. Passes unanimously. Supervisor Koenig absent. We'll do the Davenport County Sanitation District. We do have a 1045 Zone 7 meeting. That's item number 12 is the Board of Directors of the Davenport County Sanitation District, the public hearing to consider an ordinance amending District Code Title 3, Chapter 3.08, Article 3, Sections 3.08160 through 1.8. 180 water service charges and an ordinance amending district code title 4 chapter 4.08 article 3 sections 4.08160 through 1.180 sewer service charges for the Davenport County Sanitation District to direct the clerk of the board to place the ordinances on the May 16th 2023 agenda for final adoption and set 
June 13th, 2023 at 9 a.m. or thereafter is the date and time for a public hearing on the service charge reports and take related actions as outlined in the memo. For the district engineer, we have the ordinance, um, the sewer charge reports in the board memo, Mr. Machado. Thank you, Chair Friend and Supervisors. Um, the item before you is a public hearing for a 2324 Davenport County Sanitation District water and sewer service charges. Uh, on May, on, excuse me, on March 14th, the board said today is the public hearing uh, and the time for the public to consider the attached ordinances. Uh, in addition, we hosted a community meeting on April 12th, where we presented in detail the rate increases. We provided Q and A to the public. It was well attended. And uh, we um, uh, we believe we answered all their questions. Um, and so the item today uh, is a public hearing. And after the close of the public hearing, um, we have the recommended actions that the chair graciously described in detail. So I will turn it back to the board for any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Machado. Questions from board members? Supervisor Cummings? No question. Just I wanted to thank uh, Director Machado and their team for taking the time to go up to Davenport and meet with the residents. Um, it sounded like there was a lot of concerns before that meeting, but being able to understand fully the reasons behind the need to increase the rates and just the work that the county is doing to uh, you know, bring in grants to also help support the infrastructure up there. I think a lot of people were very much appreciative of you taking the time to do that. And I know that there's more that folks want to do to address water issues in Davenport. And so I'm hoping we can continue to work on that and have those conversations. But um, I haven't been receiving uh, much uh, negative feedback on this, given the fact that we were able to take the time and, and go up to Davenport and answer questions. And so just wanted to thank you again for that. The one um, correspondence I did receive was there was a resident who was concerned with the fact that um, rates are going up and there's some historically low income families that live up there and just the, them wanting to see if there's anything the county can do to help low income residents with the rate increases. And so if there's any opportunity to work on that, I'd be happy to follow up with staff. Sure. Uh, just to comment on that, um, current law proposition 218 does not allow us to create a, a lower rate for for disadvantaged uh, members. So unfortunately, we can't. I know that was a big topic that evening, and I do believe the community is looking at other options where they could create their own private fund to help those individuals out. Mm -hmm. But it's a great question, and I wish we could do more just limited by the state law. Right. But thank you for the thank you for being a part of that and hosting that yourself. Thank you. Thank you. We'd like to open up the public hearing. Is there anybody from the community that would like to address us on the Davenport uh, sewer item? Water and sewer. Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. I'm not a resident of Davenport, but I am aware that there is a very large um, recycled water facility there that is not used. And I would like um, staff to include a report at the the next hearing about this why this investment uh, is not being used i have spoken with some staff and understand that when it was um, the project was designed there were uh, some informal formal agreements with area farmers that the recycled water would be used for irrigation but now none of those farmers are using that water for various reasons. And I think that this, uh, this district should be given an accounting of all of that and why the, the uh, purpose of the recycled water plant is not being met. Couldn't it be possible to run um, some purple pipe so that people could use this recycled water for the area parks, the school lawns, things like that, that would reduce their uh, dependence on the potable water for irrigation. So it is um, unfortunate or even consider that purple pipe could be run down to the city of Santa Cruz, where indeed there would be uh, use for recycled water for parks and things of such, and could be sold to the city by the Davenport Sanitation District. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else in chambers? Is there anybody online, Madam Clerk? Chair. Call in user two, your microphone's now available. Uh, 
Um, water is a big problem and being contaminated all over by pesticide use and also I want to refer people to geoengineeringwatch.org with Dane Wigington, who talks about the weather intervention operations like held by Lockheed and Raytheon and uh, what is coming out of the patents that they have to dump um, nanoparticles of strontium, barium, et cetera, contaminating our water. I'd like to see the board take action on stopping these weather intervention operations that are polluting our water and soils and bodies. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else online? We have no further speakers, Chair. Okay, we'll close the public hearing, bring it back to the board for action. I'll move the staff recommendation on this item. A second would be appropriate. Second. All right, so we have a motion from Supervisor Cummings, a second from Supervisor McPherson. If we could have a roll call, please. Second to Chair, Supervisor Cummings. Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Friend? All right, passes unanimously with Supervisor Koenig absent. I, the freedom item is very brief, and so I'll, I'll go ahead and do that with you here. Well, I think you're probably staying anyway for zone seven, but we'll go ahead and do item 13, then we'll move to zone seven. Item 13 is as the Board of Directors of the Freedom County Sanitation District, a public hearing to consider an ordinance amending district code title three, article three, chapter 3.08 sewer service charges and direct the clerk of the board with the ordinance on the May 16th, 2023 agenda for final adoption to set June 13th, 2023 at 9 a.m. or thereafter as a date and time for a public hearing on the service charge reports and take related actions. We have the memo, the ordinance and the uh, sewer charge report, Mr. Machado. Thank you, Chair Friend and Supervisors. Uh, the item before you is a public hearing for our Freedom County Sanitation District sewer service charges. I do want to spend two minutes and explain the rate increase. It is significant this year. Uh, it is being proposed at an overall increase of 9%. There are really four drivers to that, and I'll just briefly explain them. First is inflation at 4.9%. Uh, the second factor is, uh, is a direct 1.7% increase due to sewer treatment costs. Uh, which we pay to the city of Watsonville. Uh, the third component is uh, is a significant investment in capital. Um, the uh, I'd like to share a bit on this. Uh, the district is currently finalizing an agreement with the State Water Resource Control Board for a $6 million grant that will fund the second phase of the Freedom Sewer Rehab Project. Uh, this project is planned to rehabilitate nearly 10,000 lineal feet of sewer mains and 30 manholes. The capital con contribution from the increase in sewer service charges will fund the expenses of this project that are not reimbursable by the State Water Resource Control Board. Uh, that contribution is, is at 173000 which is uh, a very small component of the $6 million grant that we received. And then the fourth component that's driving this rate increase is that in, uh, in May of 2020, we received a, a very large grant and a loan, uh, a loan of $4.5 and a grant of four and a half million for a $9 million project where we uh, rehabbed 13,000 lineal feet of pipe and uh, and more than 50 manholes. And so we're still paying debt service on that loan. And so those are the drivers that, that require this 9% uh, overall rate increase. Uh, that said, um, the item today is a public hearing and I uh, appreciate the chair reading the recommended actions and I can answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, any questions from board members? All right, we'll open up the public hearing on this item. Does anybody can get any like to address us on this item? Anybody online, Madam Clerk? We have no speakers online, Chair. Okay, we'll close the public hearing. We'll bring back to the board for action. Is there a motion? Second. We have a motion from Supervisor McPherson, a second from Supervisor Hernandez. If we could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Cummings. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. Aye. And Friend. Aye, and that item passes unanimously with Supervisor Koenig <laughs> absent. We will now move to our 1045 scheduled item, which is uh, the Board of Supervisors will now move into a zone seven meeting. Uh, Madam Clerk, do you need any additional time? Or are you okay with us getting forward and calling roll call on it? Um, I believe that everyone is going to be attending in person as far as I'm aware. If I would just take one moment to do a, a review of the um, online attendees, one moment. Sure.
Thank you, Chair. Okay, we'll move into the Flood Control and Water Conservation District Zone 7 Board of Directors regular meeting. It is about 10.53 on May 9th. If we could begin with a roll call, please. Certainly. Director Cummings. Here. Hernandez. Here. McPherson. Here. Friend. Here. Koenig. Absent. Queros Carter. Absent. Culbertson. Mm. Absent. We do have quorum, and so we'll move on to the first item, which is consideration of additions and deletions to the consent or regular agenda. Is there anything, Mr. Machado? Uh, no additions nor deletions. Thank you. All right, we'll open up with oral communications as an opportunity for members of the community to address us on items within the Zone 7 purview, but not on today's agenda. Anybody like to address us on Zone 7 today? Okay, we'll move on to item four, which is approval of the Zone 7 board meeting minutes. Are there any, are there any questions from board members on Zone 7 minutes? Any member of the community you'd like to address us on the minutes in chambers? Anybody online? We have no speakers online, Chair. All right, we'll bring it back to the board for action on item four. Is there a motion for the minutes? I'll move the minutes. We have a motion from Supervisor Cummings, or excuse me, Director Cummings, a second from Director McPherson. If we could have a roll call, please. Certainly, Director Cummings. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. Aye. And friend. Aye, and that passes unanimously with three members absent. If we'll move on to the first item of the regular agenda, which is the program manager's report for zone seven. It's a public hearing on the zone seven assessment rates for the 23-24 fiscal year to hear objections and protests, if any, and consider adoption of the resolution confirming the rate report as outlined in the memo of the district engineer. We have the agenda board memo, the summary of the rates and the resolution, Mr. Machado. Thank you, Chair Friend and directors. Uh, the item before you is our 23-24 zone seven assessment rates. Uh, the assessment rates form the basis of the zone seven revenue stream and adoption of the resolution confirming the written report on assessment rates for fiscal year 2324 will allow zone seven to perform its flood control responsibilities in conformance to commitments made to the Pajaro Regional Flood Management Agency. Uh, the two recommended actions today are to open the public hearing, hear objections and protests, uh, if any, to the proposed 2324 assessment rate report for zone seven and to close the public hearing upon conclusion of the hearing, consider adoption of the resolution confirming the written report on assessment rates for 2324 fiscal year. And I can answer any questions you may have. No, thank you. Are there any questions from directors? All right, we'll open up the public hearing. Any member of the community would like to address us on the zone seven assessment rates? I see none in chambers, Madam Clerk, anybody online? No speakers online, Chair. All right, we will close the public hearing and bring it back to the board for a motion. We would recommend that. Second. A motion from Director McPherson for the recommended actions and a second from Director Hernandez. If we could have a roll call, please. Okay. Director Cummings. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. Aye. And Friend. Aye. That item passes unanimously with three directors absent. And moving on to item six, the final item on the Zone 7 agenda is to consider approval of the 23-24 proposed budget for Zone 7 Flood Control and Water Conservation District as outlined in the memo of the district engineer. We have the board memo and the budget narrative. Mr. Machado. Thank you, Chair, Friend, and Directors. The item before you is our Zone 7 fiscal year budget. Um, presented in this memo and attachments for your consideration is the proposed 2324 district budget, the, the Pajaro River Flood Management Agency, PERFMA, uh, will take over most of the roles and responsibilities previously undertaken by the district. And because of the transfer of the responsibilities, a cost share agreement regarding contributions for operating expenses by and between the district and PERFMA was approved by the board on December 6, 2022. Um, this budget anticipates the net amount to be transferred to PERFMA estimated to be $2.9 million. Uh, the recommended action today is to consider approval of the 2324 proposed budget for zone seven flood control and water conservation districts. And I can answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, it's pretty self-explanatory. Any directors with questions and seeing none, uh, we'll open it up to the community. Any community member like to address us in chambers on the proposed budget for zone seven. <clears throat> Good morning. Thank you. It would be helpful for members of the public if the budget were displayed on the screen as you're describing it. Um, 
but I want to raise an issue that came up in a recent discussion I had with second district Monterey County Supervisor, Mr. Glenn Church, wherein he was talking about how there's a real need to evaluate the culverts that feed into the Pajaro, um, Pajaro River and the levee system there. There were improvements that were considered and uh, were going to move forward in the 90s that were dropped. So I would like to request that Public Works review these issues as part of the budget for potential uh, rehabilitation of culverts and the, the feed system of local creeks and uh, drainage systems into the Pajaro River levee system. And um, I also would really like to see um, some discussion with Dr. Helen Dalkey from UC Davis about managed, <laughs> managed flooding of uh, fields for groundwater recharge. It is a very uh, positive thing that can happen when it is managed. We don't want a repeat of what has happened with the, the levee breaking. But when managed, it is a very effective tool for groundwater recharge. And I would like to see it considered in some of the capital improvements or research analysis for the, the district. Thank you. Thank you, anybody else in chambers? Seeing none, anybody online? We have no speakers online, Chair. Okay, we'll close public comment and bring it back to the board for actions or a motion. All right, we have a motion from Supervisor McPherson for the recommended actions, a second, an enthusiastic motion from Supervisor McPherson, an enthusiastic second from Supervisor Cummings. If we could have a roll call, please. Certainly, Chairs. Uh, Director Cummings. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. Aye. And Friend. Aye. That passes unanimously with three directors absent. That will close our zone seven item. Thank you, Mr. Machado, for spending so much time up here. And we'll move back to our regular agenda, which is item 14 which is to consider the Sheriff's Office 2022 Assembly Bill AB 481 Annual Report on Military Equipment Acquisition and Use, a proven concept, the uncodified ordinance to adopt amended military equipment use policy pursuant to AB 481, schedule the uncodified ordinance for a second reading and final adoption at the next available agenda and take related actions as outlined in the memo of the Sheriff Coroner. <clears throat> we have the agenda board memo, the annual report on military equipment acquisition and use, the ordinance, um, and the policy 706, uh, Sheriff Hart. Good morning, Supervisor Friend, Board of Supervisors, Jim Hart, Sheriff Corner. With me today is Lieutenant D. Baldwin, who among his many duties, he's our AB 481 coordinator. And today we're gonna go over a synopsis of the annual report in your packet. You'll see a detailed accounting of how the equipment uh, that is defined as military equipment was used during calendar year 2022. This bill also requires that every law enforcement agency hold a well-publicized community meeting. We will hold our community meeting at the Sheriff's Office at 5200 Soquel Avenue on Tuesday, May 23rd at 6.30 p.m. We've posted the announcement of the community meeting at the county building, the Sheriff's Office, and on our social media. And this afternoon, we will send out a press release to all local uh, news outlets. A copy of the approved report will be posted on the transparency section of our website. And now Lieutenant Baldwin will go over the report, uh, the report with you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Friend and Supervisors. Thank you for the time. Uh, and like the Sheriff said, I'm here to present the 2022 Annual Report on Military Equipment. Yeah. The purpose of this presentation is to provide the board with relevant... LT, if you could just speak a little bit closer to the microphone. Then. A little better? Good. Um, there we go. Good morning. I'm here to present the 2022 annual report on military equipment. The purpose of this presentation is to provide the board with relevant information relating to what AB 481 is, a review of the annual reporting requirements for AB 481, and provide an overview of the 2022 deployments, and also provide information relating to the community engagement event that the sheriff mentioned scheduled for later this month. A quick review of what AB 481 is. This was signed into law September 2021. It's effective January 1st of 2022. It established a series of requirements for the acquisition and the use of military equipment within the county. It requires that we obtain board approval for those items. It also required uh, 
elements that we establish a policy, which we post on our website, hold a public hearing concerning military equipment and submit an annual report regarding the use of this equipment. To start, we'll summarize how the military equipment was used. You'll see in the report that our uh, narrative includes information on the type of equipment used and the circumstances surrounding each of their use. This information helps us evaluate the effectiveness of the military equipment and provide the community with a summary of how these items were used. The summary of deployments is found between pages three and five of the annual report. On this slide, you'll see a summary of the deployments. This is broken down by category. The uses are actually expanded further within the report to show the circumstances of how they were deployed into the field. The code requires that we summarize any complaints received regarding military equipment. To date, the Sheriff's Office has received no formal complaints received regarding the use of military equipment during 2022. <clears throat> Part of the code also requires that we conduct internal audits and the Sheriff's Office places great emphasis on maintaining the highest standards and readiness for prepared um, issues using our military equipment. To ensure that the equipment is in good working condition and ready to be deployed at a moment's notice, we conduct regular audits. In addition to assessing the equipment's condition, we carefully track each deployment for this annual report. The results of the internal audits showed that the Sheriff's Office military equipment is in good working condition and the internal audits found no violations of the military equipment use policy. The body of the annual report further includes the quantity of items possessed for each type of military equipment, the total annual cost for each, including acquisition, personnel, training, transportation, maintenance, storage, upgrade, and other ongoing costs, and from what source those funds will be provided for the military equipment in the calendar year following submission of this annual report. This information is available between pages eight and 32 of the report. <clears throat> and like the sheriff mentioned, we are hosting a public meeting May 23rd from 6.30 to 7.30 at the Sheriff's Office. Uh, this will give the public the opportunity to, to provide feedback and ask questions that they may have regarding our military equipment. Moving into the modifications that we've made this year to our policy 706 regarding military equipment. In an in effort to increase the clarity within the policy, we made the following changes. We amended section 706.9 in regards to public submittal of complaints, concerns, and questions. These changes that we made to the policy address how the public can submit complaints, concerns, and or questions in an effort to achieve uh, more clarity on how those issues are resolved. Finally, we added a section 706.10, which is the mechanisms to ensure compliance. The Sheriff's Office policy includes a portion about compliance with departmental policy and law. It also includes auditing the use of the military equipment and investigating allegations of misconduct and submitting the findings in the annual report. The recent legislation, SB2, also establishes a process for decertifying police officers found culpable of serious misconduct, such as physical abuse or excessive force. In closing, I'd like to thank the board for your continued support in our mission to keep the county and community safe and secure. We're committed to transparency and accountability in our military equipment and acquisition and usage and believe this report helps us maintain the trust and support of the community. Finally, I ask the board to take the recommended actions and I welcome any questions that you may have at this time. Thank you, Lieutenant Baldwin. Are there questions from board members? Supervisor Cummings. Thank you for that presentation. And um, it's great to hear that we haven't had any complaints this year as well. Um, I have been getting some emails from ACLU and um, I just wanted to see if I can ask the questions that they've been bringing to my attention. One of which was around the, the having AR-15s listed under the military equipment and the other was um, they were interested in why the, the community meetings coming after the board takes action. So just wondering if you have any comments on those two items. Sure, I'll, I'll take the uh, the patrol rifle first, the M4. And if I don't know if you have the the actual bill in front of you or not, but in section one, subsection 7070 C10, it says that military equipment means the following specialized firearms and ammunition of less than 50 caliber, including assault weapons, as defined in section 30510 and 30515 of the penal code, with the exception of standard issue service weapons, standard issue service weapons and ammunition. So all of our patrol deputies are issued and are required to carry their service pistols and patrol rifles. 
Every deputy and peace officer in the county is trained how to use these rifles, and we have them assigned throughout the sheriff's office. These rifles are standard issue. Last year, we consulted with the attorney general's office, as well as our own county council, and both county council and the attorney general agreed with our position that our patrol rifles did not qualify under AB 481. And you can see in the report that we have another rifle. It's a, it's a 308 that our SWAT team uses. And because that's not standard issue for every deputy, we do list that in this report. Great. No, thank you for that clarification. And then in terms of uh, the sequence of of the of meetings um, under 7072B of the law itself, it says within 30 days of submitting and publicly releasing an annual military equipment report, which is obviously what we're doing today, uh, the law enforcement agencies shall hold at least one well-publicized meeting where the community can ask questions. And so for me, it doesn't make sense to release basically a rough draft to the community and have that meeting and then come to your board. And if you make any amendments or changes to the report, then I, I did not give the public the completed report. So in my mind, uh, it makes sense to get you receive the board's approval on the report, get, get a completed report, send that out to the community today and then and give them time to have the, the comment period before the May 23rd meeting. That's helpful. I appreciate that um, insight and thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Hernandez. I can't even see the little green light on here. But anyways, so so the the community is able to do input then at this twenty the meeting for the twenty third that will be um, you know uh, taken into consideration then. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, I'm glad to hear that the uh, outreach efforts are going to be continued, you know, with the press release and uh, to the news outlets as well. I know it's uh, two weeks away, usually it's done 10 days before, but it's good to get the outreach done as well to the public. That's it. All right. Thank you. We'll open it up for the community. Are there members of the community that would like to address us on this item? Please feel free to step forward. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you for waiting. Good morning, uh, Lee Brokaw, Chairman of the Police Accountability Transparency Committee, ACLU Board, Santa Cruz Chapter. Um, I take great umbrage with the way that the Sheriff is dealing with standard service issue. I refer you to the Police Executive Research Forum and the way they define it. Um, the The standard service issue is like the Hi, the patch, the badge, the uniform. It's something that the officers wear all the time, including a sidearm. Um, they do not get out of their car carrying an AR-15. Um, this is a word game and it is disingenuous. Uh, the point of having a public meeting um, before the presentation to the board, according to AB 481, is to promote transparency and public input. And there cannot be any public input to uh, a, a report that is a fait accompli that's already before you. Um, if the public were to get the sheriff to change his mind, then this meeting would not be the first reading. You'd have to have a first reading a second time. So it is actually backwards. Uh, I take umbrage with the um, AR-10, the 308 rifle, where the sheriff says that the sheriff's office is not aware of any additional ongoing personnel, training, transportation, maintenance, storage, upgrade, and other ongoing basis. This kind of repetitive statement is throughout this report and is unbelievable, unbelievable. In order to have a sniper who is actually a good sniper, he has to practice all the time. And the sheriff is unaware of any further practice that is necessary. Um, I, I'm, I know I'm running out. I already have run out of time. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sporko. Thank you for waiting. Good morning. Welcome back. Good morning. Thank you for the um, presentation. I'm wondering about SB2 legislation. Does that only relate to decertifying officers with regard to the misuse 
or misconduct of these military weapons, or is that in general? I also want to know who conducted the audits. I'm raising the issues of bias and untrustworthiness by Michael Genico, who is an alleged independent auditor of law enforcement for many agencies. Uh, my uh, complaints on Mr. Genico's untrustworthiness can be found in agenda item 21, attach public documents to today's Santa Cruz City Council meeting. I would highly encourage you to read that. Um, and I'm going to request some civilian audits. I think we need civilian oversight into what's actually happening instead of these in-house audits that can be very biased, it can be misleading, and I don't think it's true transparency. So I'm going to make that request. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning and welcome back. Hello, my name is James Ewing Whitman. I know in the past maybe eight weeks, I've spoken three times on this subject in the city of Santa Cruz, so I'll try not to repeat any information, but I do appreciate the public comments before, and I do appreciate this presentation. Uh, this book, The Doctrine of the Lesser Magistrates, just describes many things that are quite interesting, and um, there's a lot of information and there could be more community involvement. I think that there actually should be more community involvement. Uh, I don't know, the 308 is an astounding tool. It's amazingly loud too. But one of the elements in the room that's not being talked about, and I believe it's on page 206 in there under 14B under all the various tools that law enforcement can use, or stuff that's not really being talked about. I know the first time I was in a city council meeting almost four years ago, um, stuff came up about the frequency weapons. And after the first 13 or 14 people spoke, I why did no one not say that? Why are these military weapons being installed in civilian areas? Now, I've spoken maybe the first or second time in the city about how law enforcement, the only people being thrown under the bus more than the teachers and youth or law enforcement, that has to do with the stuff they physically wear, which they should be educated of how easy and cheap it is to shield yourself from that. But there's frequency weapons all over the place that aren't being discussed. And uh, anybody can look at uh, 8,500 declassified documents in 1976 by almost every three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine letter agency about how these silent weapons affect all of us, whether we want to acknowledge them or not. And um, it wasn't exactly what I was going to talk about, but it's a good start. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else in chambers? <laughs> Okay, Steinbrenner, before you start my clock, can you please put back up the slide that showed the number of um, deployments and the different uh, things that are were deployed? Can you put that slide back up, please? Um, Lieutenant, do you have that on yours? We can do it very briefly. Thank you. Because it didn't stay could, up very long. And, we can um, go ahead and start the clock because your, your comment. Okay, thank you. Um, in reference to that slide, there were a number of acronyms of things. And um, I don't know what those things are. Um, it would be helpful to have them defined. It would be helpful for the public to understand what caused those um, instruments, that equipment to be deployed. And, you know, I, I want to back up a bit and first of all, thank law enforcement for the job you do. Thank you. I do appreciate that you're out there. I do appreciate how dangerous your job is. And I do appreciate that you're there to protect the public and to enforce the law. Thank you. So at this public meeting, I'm happy to know about it on May 23rd. Um, I hope that this slide and the information that's in it will be um, a little more defined and more public friendly. Uh, you know what it is, but most people don't. Um, I would like to know if there are, um, uh, as the previous speaker said, the um, electronic or um, microwave for lack of a better use, uh, weapons or, or equipment that can be activated. I, I was made aware that some of the inter, major intersections in the city of Santa Cruz and possibly in the county of Santa Cruz may have something like this. I would like more information on that. 
I want to know, um, I, I want to be sure that at this May 23rd town uh, public meeting that there is a Spanish translator available for everyone to be able to understand what's being said and to be understood. Um, I think it would be helpful to and reassuring for the public to see the training schedule that officers are required to um, to meet in order to have access to and deploy these weapons. That would be great. I would like. Uh, Thank you, Ms. Steinbrenner. Thank you. Anybody else in chambers? I see none. Madam Clerk, is there anybody online? Yes, Chair, we do have speakers online. Call in user three, your microphone's now available. Marilyn Garrett, I say no on militarization of police. The sheriff's office already has excessive equipment and force and misconduct that has been repeated to you. And there's inherent misconduct with military weapons of war. This seems to me like laying the foundation for military rule. No to military world. And I don't like what the U.S. military is doing all over the world with invasions and occupations and 800 military bases. And this also is a waste of county money with this military equipment. As I read through it, it's like in the millions of dollars. I don't know what the total is. And then you state it's like for uh, crowd control. Well, who defines that? And the list of this military equipment, uh, this is a, a war on the public as far as I'm concerned. The military equipment, and you say, oh, it's for safety. No, it's for the opposite. Um, military equipment, I'm reading from 14C, includes, but it's not limited to the following. This should be read out loud by you, Chair Friend. Unmanned, remotely piloted, powered aerial or ground vehicles. This is microwave, by the way, remotely piloted. Mine-resistant ambush protection vehicles. Tasers, which we know have killed people. Shockwave, microwave weapons, water Garrett. Anybody else online, Madam Clerk? Peter, your microphone's now available. Thank you. This is Peter Gelblum. Um, I submitted a lengthy email, which I um, hope you've read, but I doubt it. Um, I will summarize that very briefly, and then I have some comments about the annual report. I second the uh, suggestion that you continue the, this hearing until after the May 23rd community meeting, um, which what makes most sense. And AB 40, uh, this, this statute was primarily intended to increase transparency and community input into the acquisition and use of military weapons. That's the purpose of the statute. Having the community meeting after this board votes completely undermines that. And what can be done uh, in response to Sheriff Hart's suggestion is you submit the draft report to the community, let the community have input on the draft report, and then come back to the supervisors, to you, with a final report that includes the community input. Otherwise, you're completely undermining any sense of community input in the supervisor's decision, which is the only decision that matters here. Secondly, uh, the assault rifles are not standard issue weapons. There are 155 um, uh, peace officers and only 83 assault rifles. So they obviously are not standard issue. And I ask one of you to please ask Sheriff Hart to clarify how they are standard issue if only half the officers are, uh, if there are only half the weapons, if there are for, uh, half the weapons compared to the number of officers. Um, as to the report itself, ask why are there 24 drones why are 24 drones necessary 
The report says there are not, not a single penny of storage or maintenance costs for any of these weapons, even the vehicles. That is simply not possible that there are no maintenance costs for these weapons, including vehicles, and no storage costs. It's not possible. I please look at this carefully. Thank you. Thank you. Bernie, your microphone is now available. Yeah, uh, uh, good morning, uh, or close to good afternoon, chair and board. Um, I just uh, urge the board to um, ha uh, just direct the sheriff to have uh, the public uh, meeting first before coming back over here. You know, I think it's very important that you as a board and representative and constituents, right, have the full scope of uh, the conversation that's happening within uh, 481 with the sheriff and community, right? Um, it's just, uh, I think that just makes sense. Um, if not, you know, it just, again, just going back and forth and back and forth and just kind of redundant, but I think this board, you know, um, really deserves, and I would hope that would want to know what the community input is around uh, militarized equipment, in our communities, right? Um, and there's this national, you know, conversation around these type of uh, assault weapons, you know, we're seeing all the atrocities that are happening. So they are military, military grade weapons, you know, regardless if standard or not, I think this board should want to have a full uh, itemized list of what type of military equipment is, uh, is there and, or, you know, just, uh, whether or not the sheriff believes it, it it should be there or not, this bill also gives the authority for this board to request these types of things, you know, that go above and beyond just a simple status quo. Um, but again, lastly, just again, just urge the board to um, have that meeting first with public and then have that this, uh, this re report come back to you with the full scope of community input. Thank you. Thank you. We have no further speakers, Chair. All right, I would like to bring it back to the board for action. Is there a motion? Who would recommend it, Dan? We have a motion from Supervisor McPherson. Is there a second? You know, I, I, I'd i like to second, I'd just like to make a, a, not a recommendation, but you know, I'd like to continue to make sure that we, that we continue what we're doing, but also I wanna see how this plays out with this meeting, right? And maybe, if it plays out well, that'll be good. But you know, if you think that if you want to consider maybe doing the meetings uh, in the future, doing them prior to the to the uh, to the meetings, uh, prior to the board meetings, uh, if this if the way we're doing it now doesn't work out, let's consider moving it so that we do the meetings prior to the board meeting. Uh, if that's okay with Sheriff Hart. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll consider that, Supervisor. I'm, I'm not, not going to commit to it, but I will certainly consider, and I'll talk to my staff. And and I, I know Peter Gelblum, and he knows he can call me, comment, he emails me, and we 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 we, we communicate. So he knows he can always uh, express his concerns to me, as uh, Mr. Brokaw and others. Um, but I will definitely consider uh, next year having the community meeting ahead of the board meeting. It's just when you get multiple documents out there, you have a rough draft, you have a final draft, which one are we going off of? Uh, it just gets a little bit confused. And I've experienced this before with other projects. So I, I like to have that final draft board approved, presented to the community. We'll take their input. And if there's something good in there, we can always come back to you or we can put it in the, the following year's report. Okay. Do a motion and a second, any additional? So, um... I think it would also just be helpful to, to know how many people attend those meetings, um, whether that comes back in a memo or what have you, but just trying to understand the community's interest in this um, and you know how many people attend the meeting, I think will be helpful for us. We'd be happy to. Yeah. And if there's any feedback that you think will be helpful for us as well that comes out of that meeting, it'd be great for us to receive that as well. Um, but I do want to say that to one of the points that was brought up, there is a, um, in the annual report on military equipment, there is a detailed list of uh, when the, the the equipment was used. And so just so that people are aware that some of the um, information that people were requesting is within this report. And um, you can find it, it looks on um, 
page four and page five of the AB 41 annual report. Thank you. All right, we have a motion and a second. If we could have a roll call, please. Certainly, Chair, and to clarify for the record, I have Supervisor McPherson moving and Supervisor Hernandez seconding. That's correct. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Cummings. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson and friend. Aye, and that passes unanimously. Supervisor Koenig, absent. Thank you. Uh, we do have one more item. We had a pulled item from consent, which was, was item 24 is now item 15.1 to direct the chair to send letters to the chairman of the House Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure's Aviation Subcommittee, Congressman Panetta and the San Francisco International Airport Community Roundtable supporting inclusion of the noise metric and community impact related policy as part of the FAA Reauthorization Act of 2023 is recommended by Supervisor Koenig, but pulled by Supervisor Cummings. Supervisor Cummings? Yes, so um, after reading through the agenda report and based on the motion language that's before us, um, you know, one of the things we're supposed to be voting on is supporting inclusion of the noise metric and community impact related policy. And going through the packet, that policy wasn't present for us to review. And so um, I just like, I know that this FAA um, and flight path issue was something that was um, controversial in the community. And there's a lot of work that was done to um, try to address flight path related issues. And um, before we kind of move forward with supporting a policy, I'd like to have an opportunity for us and for staff to be able to review um, the policy recommendations that are supposed to be considered under the Federal Aviation Administration Reauthorization Act of 2023. And I also know that Supervisor Koenig isn't here today to be able to respond to any of our concerns. And so I think that's even more of a reason for this to come back to us so that we as a board can ask questions as to, you know, um, what it's the intent of moving this forward and, um, you know, be able to better understand this policy uh, and how it's and and um, yeah, I'll just leave my comments there. Continuing the item to the next meeting would be totally within the board's purview. So if you are open to that, we could make a motion to just continue this item with, um, but can you continue with additional direction? I guess you can, you can. Uh, so continue maybe with the additional direction of the policy being attached. Yeah. All right, but, so if there's no additional comments on this, I'll open it up to the community on this item. Is there anybody who'd like to address this on this item? Okay, I'll bring it back to Supervisor Cummings for a moment. I'll, I'll move that we continue this I'm item. sorry. I'm oh, sorry. We've um, had my mistake. Is there anybody online? That's my mistake. I apologize. Yes, Chair, we do have a speaker online. Sorry about that. Call in user three. Your microphone's now available. Marilyn Garrett, <clears throat> this sounds like um, an important inclusion. Uh, to have, and I'd like to have something else included with the in your letter to the Aviation uh, House Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure's Aviation Subcommittee. I know I had read about uh, the 5G interference with the airport equipment and uh, there are major cell towers, for instance, at these airports and the one in Watsonville. This is a problem and the potential of equipment failure and therefore causing crashes. Um, I think that needs to be included in. There was something, I, maybe you know the status about not having 5G near the airports. I don't think it should be anywhere. I think what is dangerous frequencies should be prohibited and made to, they need to prove what they're using is safe and not harming the public. You talk about safety a lot. What about protection of our making sure we're safe by not being assaulted by these military and microwave frequencies? I'd like to have that included. Thank you. Anybody else online? We have no further speakers, Chair. Okay, I apologize about that. I'll bring it back to the board now for a motion. Yeah, I'll move the um, that we continue item number 24 to the next meeting. Uh, and um, upon re this returning to the agenda, that it includes the policy, um, the noise metric and community impact related policy. Second. 
All right. But yeah, I'd just like to say uh, thank you. I think it's well uh, well deserved that we we look at this. The county has been frustrated for years about of the transparency of the FAA in this issue, as we all recall, who were there at the time. Uh, the FAA is a federal uh, agency, and that's where the decision is made based on uh, safety and and uh, and economy is what they put it. But uh, I'll, I'll look forward to seeing with this in more detail. Thank you. Thank you. We have a motion from Supervisor Cummings and a second from Supervisor Hernandez. We could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Cummings. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. Aye. And Friend. Aye. And that passes unanimously with Supervisor Koenig absent. We do have a lengthy closed session. Um, County Council, is there anything expected to be reportable out of that? No. All right. Then we will adjourn our regular meeting, go into closed session. <laughs>